Will the February 19th, 2014 meeting of the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission please come to order? Thank you all for your attendance this evening. For the benefit of those present who may not have participated in the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, I will review our public hearing procedure, which is as follows. We will read the legal notice for the public hearing portion of this meeting is published in the local newspaper. The applicants will then be invited to come forward and present their case, explaining to the Commission and the public what is specifically being requested of the subject property. Written comments from town agencies pertaining to the application will then be read into the record if the Commission has received any. The commissioners will then ask their clarifying questions and the public will then be invited to ask any questions they have about the application. I will then ask those in attendance who support the application to please come forward and make their statement. And then I will ask those in attendance who oppose the application to please come forward and make their statement. As this is a public hearing, it will be necessary for those coming forward to ask questions or to speak for or against any application to please identify themselves and state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding. At the conclusion of all statements from the public and the applicant, I will close the public hearing on each application. The applicants and the public are then free to leave or remain for the balance of the public hearings and the regular meeting at which time the Commission will discuss each application under consideration and try to reach a decision. Each applicant will be notified in writing as to the decisions of this Commission. The applicant and or any aggrieved party with legal standing will have the right to appeal this decision to Superior Court within the statutory time frame if they so desire. All decisions reached at this meeting will be available to the public the next day uh, by either visiting or calling the Planning and Zoning Office after 9.30 a.m. Seated this evening are the following Guilford Planning and Zoning Commissioners. <clears throat> David Grigsby, Walter Corbier, Amre Bauer, Frank D'Andrea, uh, Josh Hirschman, uh, Rich Meyer, and the staff, uh, town staff present this evening, George Crowell, Town Planner, Reggie Reed, the Zoning Enforcement Officer. In addition, we have uh, Shannon Gale is our videographer this evening, and we also have uh, Kathy, I'm sorry, yeah, as our recording secretary. Uh, will the secretary please read the legal notice? I'll start with the big one. Yes. Legal notice, Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission, due to severe weather following the following applications due to be heard at a public hearing on February, fi February 5th, 2014, will be heard at public hearing February 19th, 2014 at 7.30 p.m., at the Nathaniel B. Green Community Center, Monuncatuck Room, 2nd Floor, 32 Church Street, Guilford, Connecticut. Brooks Landing, LLC, Sachems Avenue, Map 2, Lot 24, Zone R2. Coastal Area Management Site Plan, Footpath Restoration Within 100 Feet of Co Critical Coastal Resource, Section 273-91. Barrow, James, 120 Neck Road, Map 25, Lot 4, Zone R6. Coastal Area Management Site Plan, remove rock landward of coastal jurisdiction line, replace wood bulkhead with rock bulkhead, place rock on west and east property lines, and restore regrade beach area. Section 273-91. Camp, Philip and Lauren, 299 Old Sachems Head Road, Map 3 and 4, Lot 30 and 9A, Zone R5. Coastal Area Management Site Plan Demolition and Construction of a New Residence Related Construction Activities and a New Septic System Within 100 Feet of Critical Coastal Resource, Section 273-91. View, David, 521 State Street, Map 80, Lot 107A and B, Zone R5, Special Permit for Accessory Apartment in Barn and Studio Office, Guest Accommodations in Corn Crib, Section 273-36. Copies of these applications are available for inspection in the office of the Planning and Zoning Commission, Town Hall South, 50 Boston Street, Guilford, Connecticut. At this hearing, persons may attend and be heard, and written communications will be received. Dated at Guilford, Connecticut, this sixth day of February 2014, Ray Bauer, Chairman. Thanks very much, Walter. Uh, first item on the agenda this evening, David View, 521 State Street. I uh, believe this uh, application was opened at a prior meeting. There was an issue that came up with written notice, and I believe, George, that's been rectified at this point. All abutting owners have received written notice, so we decided to leave the public hearing open. Uh, what I'm I would. Sorry, I oh, I'm sorry. I didn't it's realize that. Um, all right, continuation of legal notice. Ives, Penelope, 2158 Boston Post Road, map 78. Lot 9, Zone R5, Special Permit for Recreation Area in Detached Structure, Section 273-36A, dated at Guilford, Connecticut, this 29th day of January, 2014. Okay. Thank you very much Sorry again, Walter. That's okay. 
So what I would do then, Mr. View, is to ask you if you have any more input which you'd like to provide for the record. We already did do a majority of this last time. And then we'll ask for questions from both the Commission and the public, and then we'll ask for people speaking for or against the application once again. Sir, do you have anything you'd like to say? I don't have any more, but I think we went through it uh, very detailed last time. Okay. Uh, I did receive a letter that I think Reggie got in, in support. Should I give that over for Reggie? Yes. Yes, yes. we yes. want to make sure that's part of the record. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll mark this as an exhibit and we'll include this in the record. And it's from John Hodson, 521 State Street. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's the, uh, he's from 180 State Street, John Hodson. And he's apparently speaking in favor of it. All right, um, are there any questions? that were carried over from the last meeting. The only question I had was that the notice was given, so everybody did receive written notice, and then uh, that, that basically Correct. covered. <coughs> Is there anybody in the uh, audience which would like to ask any questions of the applicant about this? Sir. Hello, David. How are you? Good. Bud Benson, 10 North Plains Road West. Uh, at the last meeting, I, I expressed my uh, feelings that I have no feeling against the uh, accessory apartments such that my uh, my worry is is to as its usage and David confirmed that uh, he said on a couple of occasions that it's for personal use and not for any kind of business use my question to uh, the group is how do we determine and that is there any way of following up on that so that uh, three months down the road if David's decisions changes, and it turns into a business situation. Uh, is there any follow-up on the part of the town in regard to the purpose of the assessment department? Well, if we discover that it uh, became something different, then we would take appropriate action if there were any uh, okay. action to be taken. And how does that discovery uh, process work? If someone would complain to you? Typically, or? we would get a complaint from a neighbor. And then you would because would. I'm not going to go to the right. property then, every week. Oh no, I know, I understand that. But you, you would look into it. Typically, a neighbor complains, and then we follow up, whether it's an anonymous complaint or somebody who actually, yeah. you know, tells us who they are. Okay. It's better if they tell us who they are because then we can sure. keep them apprised of uh, progress, you know, and what's being done. Right. As well, a, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the last items on the agenda is a municipal citation for a violation of a site plan which was a similar kind of situation and you'll, you know, you'll see how we handle that if you want to stay or you can see it on the video but it, typically what happens is first of all he's not being approved for a business use here okay if he wants to do that in the future he'll need to come back here he'll need to be noticed everybody will have an opportunity to come and be heard I would say nine times out of ten we way we find out about something is there is a complaint from a neighbor there's they contact the zoning enforcement officer and once she receives a complaint, uh, Reggie will go out and investigate the matter and bring the findings back. And we can uh, initiate fines, cease and desist order. Uh, at some point, I suppose, you could even go forward and get uh, some kind of a restraining order if it was necessary to force the individual to conform to what the approval was. Well, as, as you all know, it, it's a residential neighborhood, and we want to keep it that way. Uh, it's important to everyone that lives there, and uh, I appreciate uh, <coughs> David's uh, comments, and uh, it's not that I don't believe him, but that things do change as time goes on uh, occasionally, and uh, I want to be sure that there is a, uh, a recourse in, in case that happens. There is, and it's, you know, important to be vigilant, and if you see something that doesn't look right to you, you should make a call to the zoning enforcement officer. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other people who have any questions about this particular application? Is there anyone who wants? Good. Sure, sure, absolutely. What, what exactly is the investigation? Let's say you had a, a, a phone call and they said, you know, I think that someone's running a business out of there. What do you do? Just go out go and take and a look. And if I could see evidence of the business, Nirvana. If I can't, I contact a homeowner, send them a letter, tell them we got a complaint. And I would like to uh, allow me to enter the premises and investigate the complaint. 
Yeah, I, mean, I sort of know where people are going. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't come down at midnight and kick in the door and make an inspection on something. The thing we try to do is rely on the public. I mean, we take the applicant at their word when they're asking for something that they're limited to what it is that's approved. If they want to go beyond that, they need to. They know they need to come back and make an application. If they're trying to pull a fast one, so to speak, then, like I said, most of the time the neighbors pick that up, goes to Reggie, she'll conduct an investigation, and we'll pursue it to the extent we have. Now, in the past, we have had situations where we've fined people. Uh, since I've been on the commission, there's one case where we actually brought a lawsuit, uh, which we won, and we have a lien on the property for, uh, I forget how much money it is, but it's a couple, couple 11, thousand. thousand. Yeah, eleven thousand dollars. So that individual will not be able to sell the property until that lien is, is taken care of. So we you know, have some teeth into, uh, into enforcing these things. Uh, other questions from the commission? Any other questions from the public? Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application? Is there anybody wishing to speak against the application? Okay, one more opportunity. Okay, hearing none, I'll close the public hearing on this matter. Thank you. Next item is Brooks Landing, LLC. This is a CAM site plan for a footpath restoration within 100 feet of the critical coastal resource. Is uh, there someone here representing the applicant? Yeah. Oh, good. Excellent. So my name is Angus Mayer. I'm at the Avenue, which is close to the position of the project. I'm here uh, on behalf of the Brooks Landing LLC. Uh, originally, Michael Bracken, who's the more senior managing partner of the LLC, who was here, but he couldn't make it because of the, uh, the weather uh, um, uh, changing the data meeting he's in Europe. So I was uh, involved in all the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, back and forth with Reggie about this. I may not be able to answer all the questions, but hopefully I can answer them. <clears throat> so this is a retrospective application. We've already completed this uh, restoration um, to uh, store a path on Brooks Landing LLC. Uh, you have a map of the uh, position of the, the uh, path, which is at the intersection of three properties. Um, the Layton's property, the uh, 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 Brooks Landing LLC, and the, uh, another property, which is sort of a triangle uh, position. And it's adjoining a uh, path that was established to um, uh, join a right away to, uh, which is access to Brooks Landing, um, uh, the property of Brooks Landing, um, to extend that uh, right of way around uh, the path until I access from either side of the, uh, the property. And it sits uh, behind uh, sort of an area of riprap, which is on the, uh, the beach, uh, which has been there for 50 or 60 or 70 years. I'm not really sure. Historically, how long it's been there. So the, um, the original path was uh, so severely damaged in Irene. We restored it partially. Uh, at that time, it was then restored after Sandy. And so this is a third restoration. And to do that, uh, we wanted to add larger stones that would not move around in the hurricane. The hurricane moved uh, some of the stones and were perhaps substantially as well as the stones that we had on the path. So uh, basically, some stones were left exactly the same way as they were before, some of the larger ones. And we either uh, reset some of the um, other larger stones that were in the property, uh, in, the, in the pathway area, um, so they were flat surfaced up, or uh, we brought in some new stones. And so basically, we ended up uh, using the exactly the same type of stone we granite that was um, part of the original uh, riprap, and uh, completed the, uh, the path, which is our picture, I think, in the, uh, in the application. Um, we completed this uh, it was between March and April 2013, uh, and uh, as far as I can see, there's been no adverse effects of what we did. Uh, but subsequently, uh, Reggie contacted Mike Bracken and said that we should have completed this uh, this coastal area management site plan, which has been submitted, and you have it in front of you. And that's basically the plan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a letter in the file from Kevin McGee, the town environmental planner, dated February 5th. 
uh, regarding this application. The application is for the after the fact restoration of a stone walkway damage during Storm Sandy. A site visit uh, conducted in October of 2013 revealed that a new stone walkway was constructed along with the installation of additional rocks on top of a rock uh, revetment. The placement of the rock appears to be at a slightly higher elevation than the adjacent rock revetment. The work conducted did not appear to have caused any adverse effects to the coastal resources of Long Island Sound. Any questions from the commissioners? Sure. Uh, isn't that the next one, 120 Next okay. Street? I think that's the next application, that one. I think that's the only one we have in the file, right? Okay. Uh, any, any questions of the applicant? There anybody in the pub from the public who would like to ask a question? Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application, or is there anyone wishing to speak against the application? Okay, one more opportunity. Any so questions? If they had come to us beforehand, presumably we would have had some kind of observation or some kind of input about you know, where the rocks were going to be stored, where the construction equipment was going to be Correct. running. This is all just has happened after the fact. So Correct. fencing, all that kind of activity. Right. Yeah, they, they didn't realize um, just by, you know, putting rock back that they had to make an application to the commission. They were not aware of it. Um, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I'll close the public hearing on this matter. And we will move on to James Barrow, 120 Neck Road, CAM site plan to remove rock landward of the coastal jurisdiction line, replace the wooden bulkhead with a rock bulkhead, and place uh, rock on the west and east property lines and restore, regrade the beach area. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Michael Harkin, Professional Engineer and Principal of Harkin Engineering, located at 78 Wolf Hollow Lane in the town of Hillingworth, Connecticut. Again, here tonight, I'm here on behalf of my client, Mr. James Barrow, for his project at 120 Net Road. Um, Mr. Barrow would have liked to have been here tonight. He's actually in Ireland um, visiting his daughter. Um, the rescheduling of, of this meeting kind of um, messed up his plans of attending. But uh, he did want me to make the statement that he wishes that he was here. Uh, the project at 120 Neck Road is a, um, a very complex project. This is um, one of the projects that overlap many, many state and local jurisdictions. Uh, a little history of what happened. Um, back in 2011, 2012, uh, we had Irene come in, do some damage to the property. At that time, Mr. Uh, Eric Anderson, the surveyor, went out there and surveyed the property and the surrounding area to document what was there. Mr. Barrow um, did some, some small major fixes, or small minor fixes, to the uh, wooden bulkhead that was previously in place. Uh, along comes Sandy. Uh, Sandy virtually wiped out the area of the property that had the wooden bulkhead and uh, screwed some of the, the smaller rocks across the property. The owner, Mr. Barrow, subsequently hired a contractor. Uh, the contractor, in his belief, didn't need any permits, didn't pull any permits, um, went and just did the work. Uh, he replaced the bulkhead, added more rock, so on and so forth. At that time, uh, DEP was in the area doing some investigations and came across the, the property with the machines running, um, issued them a cease and desist and a notice of violation. And that came from the Office of Long Island Sound Programs. Uh, that came, the notice came, I believe, in, in July of this summer, this past summer. Mr. Barrow then hired me to um, virtually work with DEP to come to a um, conclusion on how we're going to rectify the situation. So through October and November of last year, 2013, uh, my office uh, put together a plan in which the Office of Long Island Sound approved to do the work that was below the coastal jurisdiction line. Uh, this contractor not only put rock below the DEP's coastal jurisdiction line, but they also put it inside <coughs> of Long Island Sound on state property. So my plan was to, A, go in and do a remediation work of that area. It's approximately 30 cubic yards of rock that was placed in. The pictures on the uh, lower left-hand side of the board you can see this is the area, you can see the newer stone that was placed within DEP's jurisdiction. 
Subsequently, from the Office of Long Island Sound Program, uh, they mandated that we do a certificate of permission, which is the large-scale DEP application for that work. And to keep the rock that you see here that's both past the coastal jurisdiction and landward of the coastal jurisdiction line has to now be documented. Even though it was in place back in the 30s and 40s, there is no grandfather rule with DEP or a grandfather clause. Anything um, that is in place has to be uh, mandated and, and physically put on file that it is there um, prior to the storm events, which we are in the midst of going through and doing. That took care of Office of Long Island Sound. Now, above the coastal jurisdiction line, which you see here, any work that was done had to be documented with the town. The work was about 99.9% .9 complete when the violation was handed to them. So they, the contractor didn't care, he was able to leave and um, had the project virtually done. Now, we went through and we documented in the CAM application um, everything that was done on this site. The wooden bulkhead was completely destroyed, so it was repaired or replaced with a rock bulkhead, which you can see the limits of in some of the photographs. That rock bulkhead is at the same elevation, same exact elevation, and the same exact location um, as the previous wooden bulkhead for the most part. So that was a legal move that they could do, which is approved by DEP. Uh, second of all, there was a small rock wall that was built on that road. It was reconstructed. There was something there, but they rebuilt it. Third of all, the rock that was in place back in the 30s and 40s was disrupted and moved in order to create that rock bulkhead. So they took some of this rock out, they put some in, they moved it around, that still has to be on that CAM application. Lastly, there is a small area on our plan that you see to the east of the property, which is highlighted. That was rock that the contractor actually went on someone else's property and dropped as part of this project. So, with all that being said, we have a plan, which I'm going to hand out, which states all the work that's going to be done on the site. This is a, a revised plan. And I'll just go over it really quick. Uh, to, just to let you know, this has been approved by DEP, Mr. John Goucher. Uh, I believe you're going to find a letter in the file from Mr. Kevin McGee that has also approved this. We've had a site meeting out there to go over everything that we're virtually be, is being shown. The first part of the application is this rock wall that was pre-existing that they rebuilt. It was pre-existing and they rebuilt it, but it's within the town right-of-way. Town Engineering Department, when they reviewed the CAM application, asked that we take that wall and move it back onto uh, Mr. Barrow's property, which we agreed to. Uh, there is a note on the plan and it's shown on the plan, relocated rock wall. Um, we will move that back on the property. There was also a small extension of that wall that was uh, new, wasn't in place prior to the storm. That section is being removed. On the east side of the property, um, where there is rock on the neighbor's property, we are calling for that to be removed. It's approximately seven cubic yards. Uh, upon a request from uh, Reggie Reed, we have a, a, a letter in the file from the neighbor allowing us and granting us permission to go on that property and remove it, move that rock. A, he stipulates that he doesn't want on his property, kind of don't blame him. Number two, he gave us permission to go on there and take it out. Where is that shown in this photograph? It's better shown in the bottom right photograph. It's right in there. It's a very small area. It's about 16 feet long by 6 feet wide. It's the boats, it's just the very lower left hand yeah, corner. It's, very yeah. it's uh, shown in the, the lower right hand photograph. Um, there's a little bit of rock, there's some shells that are covering it. It's, okay. it's a very small area. And, and again, the reason that we were able to discover the difference in the discrepancies is we had a survey from 2011 before any of this work was done. Right after the violation, I sent the surveyor back out there for an updated survey in 2013, we were able to overlap those two surveys so we know exactly what has changed and where it has changed. 
The other area is along the westerly property line. There's a row of rock that you see here. It's not a seawall. It's just to you know basically delineate the existing property line. Uh, we had asked DEP when we removed the rock, pursuant to the Office of Long Island Sound Programs application, if we could just line this area um, with a little bit more of the boulders. And that was agreed upon, and that's shown on the plan as well. There's also a small area out in the back, the southerly portion of the yard area. You can see it in the second photograph from the right. Um, you can still see where all the sand has been washed out. That's an area where if we have any additional rock that DEP has allowed us to put in there and then cover it up with the sand in the springtime when everybody gets their sand deliveries. So to put it all in a nutshell, we're here for the CAM application for the work that was previously done at the site. We have Mr. Goucher's um, from DEP's approval uh, with this revised plan. We have Kevin McGee's approval, who's the environmental planner for this plan. And then we have uh, work to be done within the Office of Lion Science Program's approval. And then we still have to submit a certificate of permission to Office of Lion Sound for all the rock that is on the site. So okay. It's over. With well, the the CAM application would be over here, but I still have to submit more applications to the state. Well, we do have a letter from John Goucher, uh, Environmental Analyst 3 from the Office of Long Island Sound Program, State of Connecticut. Um, in this case, he says, uh, stated February 18th, uh, addressed to Michael and to Kevin, this looks good to me. Accordingly, we have no comments for the Planning and Zoning Commission's consideration regarding this proposal's consistency with CCMA policies. Uh, in addition, we do have a letter dated January 29th from Mark uh, Damiani, Assistant Town Engineers and the Public Works Director. Uh, the subject site plan indicates that the existing rock wall along Neck Road is located in the town right of way. This rebuilt rock wall and small section of new wall, wall along the eastern property lines needs to be reset back on the northerly property line of the parcel. This relocation will facilitate road travel and road maintenance after coastal storms. So you're familiar with that request? And yes, it's shown on the updated plan. Good, um, okay. All right then, uh, questions from the commission? Um, John Goucher on the February 4th for the letter to Kevin McGee saying I want to inspect the site? Yes. Did uh, that happen? Did he set any apparently that's satisfied? That's happened. Okay. That did happen. To, to back up, I requested a meeting prior to that letter two weeks prior. Okay. Um, I guess they were inundated at DEP. They couldn't get out to the site. Um, he wrote that letter. I think two days or a day before when the previous meeting was supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, the following day, I was able to get in touch with him and we set it for the next week. He and Kevin McGee and myself met at the site and went over the plan. Uh, we subsequently revised the plan for what was discussed at the meeting mm -hmm. on site, submitted it back to him, and I think yesterday he had sent the, the letter that uh, the chairman had read. That's right, Tuesday, February 18th, it's dated. This whole rock wall strikes me as being uh, an example of what they would refer to as an erosion control. Everything um, on the site is an erosion control whole, structure. You, you don't really show an elevation if, if the, I'm assuming the slope as exists is there because that's a stable slope. If you're taking that rock that's into the water out, aren't you going to have a much steeper slope, which will presumably be less stable? Not really. Okay. Um, the, the pictures are kind of deceiving. These rocks, <coughs> although they look small, like you can pick them up, are actually almost three cubic yards. They're three by three. They have to be picked up with an excavator. So when you're taking that area out of there, it's just one boulder here or there. There's not a whole big change coming out of here. You're not excavating this whole bank out. Mm -hmm. It's spotted boulders. The boulders are locked in and chinked in, so we're really not taking uh, the mass or the support of the wall. This is more of a John Goucher issue than it's our issue, but it's... And we're taking sporadic boulders, we're not taking okay. bowl strengthening. Okay. Again, this whole project, um, we kind of 
have got the, the nod that the COP will be approved because they realize that without the rock that was put back in the 30s and 40s, this parcel wouldn't exist. The erosion would just completely take it out. So although we, we have to do it and it's a formality, it has to be in place because that is their procedure um, as far as structures along the shoreline. This area where um, extra rock can be buried, uh, you request you requested that area, or they presented that as the option? It seems very specific yeah. for them. We requested the area. Um, John Gaucho said, you know, that's fine. Kevin McGee um, from the town requested that we put it a approximate size and show that area on the plan to document it. Um, something else that, that's important with all the applications, office online and sound, and what has to be done for the, the CAM and the remediation, Somebody from my office is mandated by DEP. They have to be on site when all this work is going on. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? One. Any, um, sure. Um, does uh, Mr. Eric Plumas or Ms. Uh, Deborah Brown, did they express any other concerns besides wanting the rock removed and giving permission to go on the property to remove it? They did not express any concerns. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the public? Yeah. Sir. Uh, Richard Amberling, live at 141 Neck Road, diagonally across, and, and I'm one of the owners of the beach that's on the easterly side. We were not notified, but uh, Eric Pullumas forwarded me the email from Jim, okay. and uh, I was party to, to the request to remove the stones. Um, I've been there since 1978. In 1978, there were <clears throat> very few stones on the side and very few in the front. I'm not sure what this 1930 and 40 time frame is, but they weren't there in 78. Maybe somehow they moved back and forth. Um, I'm very much in favor of a seawall to protect this property and to protect our property across the street. Every time there's a southerly decent storm or a nor'easter, all of this stuff uh, on his property ends up on the Bloomuses and our property across the street. Um, ever since this riprap was dropped, sometime in the 90s, our beach has continuously eroded and it's not the beach that it was. Whether that had any, anything to do with it or not, I'm not, I, you know, I really don't know. But certainly the characteristics have changed. Um, did, did you have aerial surveys or anything from earlier to see when the rocks were uh, all we have is what's before us in yeah, this application okay. I, so I went online and I'm pretty not good at it and I looked at a 1990 <coughs> Connecticut uh, aerial survey from 1990 survey image ID 47 CT 1450 and there are no visible rocks or riprap showing from it. My point is that this all happened and I believe I'm not sure when the law when you couldn't do this or when you could do this. I'm not sure I came home from work one day and there were rocks uh, in front of our beach. Uh, I wish somebody had, had taken them out a long time ago. My question is all along Neck Road, which is Circle Beach Road in Madison. When I see people doing seawalls, they're doing it on their property. They're doing it from their property backward, not from their property forward into public land or our property, meaning the Palumas, ours, and the Weisbergs. Three of us own this beach. So my question is what hardship would it be to do it the right way? Um, there were wooden bulkheads in 78 there and of course they would have gone and the right way would have been to replace them with standard whatever the standard practice is i, I find it hard to believe that shoring these things up back filling them with riprap is the proper way to do it but if it is it is 
Um, I also, <coughs> hopefully when they start doing this, they'll blaze and mark our property line. In the past, I've removed walls that have been put up after I had it surveyed, steps from this property going to our beach, not from Jim Barrow, the previous, uh, the previous owner. Um, it, it would be nice to do it the right way. Having said that, uh, hopefully somebody is looking out for the town, you know, the, the high water mark. I have nothing to do beyond the high water mark, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, beyond the high water mark, that's the state's that's the state jurisdiction, so it would be a state issue. We're from mean high tide, I think, land. Okay, no, but, but now to the extent that there's activity taking place across the property line, I mean, that sounds like a trespass to me and something that probably would need to go to court to get that resolved. But no, let, me, let, me, sure. let me say, I have no problem with them going on our property to remediate anything. Okay. okay, but in the future, should they start putting more material on your property? It wouldn't be nice. Well, no, I'm, that's what I'm <laughs> saying is I think your recourse is probably to to sue them in court and to get that uh, stopped and, sounds, and changed. Well, but what we don't want to create here is to create a problem, okay, exactly. by this. So do you and have any not, comments on the gentleman? I mean, this yeah, is to absolutely. standard practice, yep. and I just want to make sure where everyone is comfortable what's happening here. We all know what to expect. Yeah, let me state for the record that the structural integrity of the rock that was put in, I have not worked on. So, so my firm wasn't involved with any of the work that was there. Our firm came in to get the permitting aspect taken care of. Okay. Right. So whether this is a feasible permanent alternative, that's not for me to decide. I physically went through the correct process with permitting. Um, second of all, within the CAM application packet, we do show an aerial. Um, this is uh, 2002 of that rock being there. Okay. Um, Mr. Barrow, I think took ownership of the property. Early mid, 90s, maybe? Mid to early 90s, yep. yeah. And, and this rock was in place at that time. Some, oh, it, yeah, some, some of the some rocks, 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 it's been at, because it was there, it has been added to since then. It was started with a little, and it's become a lot. Right. Okay. So there's, there's, there's no denying the rock was there, it's in place. DEP wants the full application on this. Once it's documented, because it wasn't documented before, they have a guide now to carry on from this moment on that what was there and what wasn't there, basically to police and anything. If Mr. Barrow does anything extra um, and somebody sees it on there, now they have a reference point to start from um, with that COP application. Sir, are you, are you expressing concern about this area that is not scheduled yeah. to be removed? Exactly, that which is the continuation of this. This is our beach, and it used to be a regular beach in the 80s. And then, I have no idea if the, the ebb and flow changed after the riprap was done, and you can see you have to leap down now, etc. cetera. Um, but you want this, the, what is scheduled to be removed, you do in fact want it removed. Oh, I'd love that re removed, and, and whatever was placed in front of it, which is in the public public area that was not there in 1978 well, or 1990. Well, let me just, David, you're, you're a real estate attorney here. The, the rocks that are on your property now, I would think you would have a right to remove well, those if you got the necessary I, permits, right? Well, it's on your like, property. This is not theirs anymore because it, it is it's below, below the, the It's below the, right, even though, the even though where? it's going to, it says okay. on the deed, it's but it, closer, it's right. below the high tide line. But up to, to, up to the high tide line, which is this guy, right? You could take that piece out up to there. Which they're saying they want to take out. Okay. okay. Or is that the high well, tide Well, I think that's the high tide line yeah. there, so there's a little piece there, but to go in here, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure where, anyway, I, that's, I that's would, the, hopefully this would be blazed or marked so it could be idiot proof for me to see if in fact what they're doing is 
wholly on their property or not. Is this pinned or is there a monument there? There is no pins there, but within the officer line sound letter, my plan is to have all the property lines marked prior okay. to any sort of construction. So the property lines are going to be marked um, so everybody knows where they're going, where they're doing the work. There you okay. go. I get based on, on what I heard. It sounds like the DP was going on a premise that these stones were there in 1935. And my point is that they were not, and somebody should do a little due diligence and see when, in fact, they did get there. The state of Connecticut, I found out, has um, a catalog of surveys starting from the 1930s. <coughs> so it wouldn't be, if I can do it, and I'm pretty much an imbecile on the computer, I think somebody could easily do it. Have you brought that to the state's attention as part of Because apparently there's another permit that's <coughs> going to be required. Here. Absolutely, and that permit requires to historically show what was there throughout the years. Uh, the site that the gentleman's referring to is Yukon's historical yeah. infrared site. Okay. okay. So when we do the COP, you go through and you, you document all those sites and you put it in the application. Uh, the application has to show that there was rock there prior to 1985. Okay. 85 and below. Uh, when you go on the site and you can see that there's wooden bulkhead, there's things that were there up through the years when the house was physically there. That all gets documented and put in the COP application. Okay. 85 and below is the number of this permit. Do, do you want, um, this is the thing, I, I guess, that, uh, this is not exactly really in our jurisdiction anymore. Not beyond the being high tide line. So, where your property ends is also where our jurisdiction actually mm -hmm. does end. Um, this, um, I'm not sure that you actually necessarily want most of this removed. It might, you don't know what the consequences of that might well, be. It wasn't, it wasn't there 25 years <laughs> well, ago. I mean, whether, ago. whether it was there or not there, I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to I, I, play with it. <laughs> and I'm not a marine hydrologist. Um, but I, th I think that this is the thing that we really can approve this evening as, as presented. Is there a mechanism for uh, being in a butter to this that the state would notify me or anything when these things are happening? Because I'm not getting notified, or do I have to? The, um, how would I even well, for the CAM application, were, was notice sent out on? That's, yeah, but that's local jurisdiction. Right, for the local. The, the I don't know what the state. With the certificate of permission, I don't know if they physically do or do not. I I, honestly, I don't know the answer to what the state um, needs to do and to notice you if it's in their jurisdiction. I, I don't know they the answer. Do, I believe they do ask for a list of um, abutters adjacent as well. So, so. so. we decided the, the coastal jurisdiction line is. This thing and then yes, well, the coastal jurisdiction line is right up there. Right. And where does it go? This right here yeah. is the high, the mean high, uh, mean high water line. Yeah. And this coastal jurisdiction line comes right up here. Okay. So anything landward of that is part of the zoning jurisdiction. That is correct. And so all of all of this is in fact on the wrong side of the property line. That wasn't put in with the recent work that was done. Okay, that, so we, not, and we so can't it's not document part of the application. Put in, correct. We okay. can only document from 2011 when we had the original survey after Irene, the work was done after Sandy, I was able to compare it. So we overlaid 2011 over 2013 to find out what was added within those that two year time frame. Mm -hmm. And that was the area that came up. But see, my point was though that if this gentleman wanted to remove that stone, it's on his property. It's landward of the coastal. Uh, he would have to come in with a permit. Right to to remove, but he could. You could remove that if yes. you wanted to yourself. On his property, I, I believe that he has. You have the right to. At, at which point are we get, are we thinking? All of that. All of that. This side of the because coastal the, area that line. That has been added to continuously since the first time that the previous owner added some riprap in lieu of doing the wall right. the proper way, the, right. the, uh, the sea wall. So it sounds to me... It, it, every time there's a few more on top. Of it. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like you would have the right to, if you get the necessary permits, to go in and remove that, since that's on your property. Depends on what but it well. looks like they're about to remove 
the majority of the rocks that are on your property. This is well, almost no, up here. here. There's, There's quite a bit here, though. That's but this is this is the mean height. Where is the mean height? Well, it's the coastal area line, like which is we think is this one right here. There. But the okay. one coastal I see where you're saying. Yeah. Just, just to make yeah. make it clear and show on the big map, show yeah, everybody sure. can see it. The area in question, there's a property line that runs um, towards the water that we see here. There's a coastal jurisdiction line. There's an area of rock that runs uh, approximately maybe 70, 70 feet, between 70 and 50 feet, um, approximately 10 feet wide, that was there prior to any of the storm events that the gentleman asked if it could be removed, if it was on your property, yes, it could be removed. Yeah, you just have to go through the, the permit, the CAM application, and everything else. I mean, we're only permitting work that's on this individual's property with the exception here, which they've received your permission to go on and remove that. That's the only right. work we're requesting. Can you ask if they show me the Southern Lake property line? Um, uh, Mr. Oh, yeah, the property line. He's talking about the mean high tide. Property line on the along the east high water. So that's his property line. That's right. He he owns and the, what from there going northward. That's correct. Oh, okay. As opposed to it's a straight line. None of those are his property line. That is correct. That's okay. a tie line in order for them to, okay. to get the survey. I feel better because we're dropping <laughs> on his own property. Um, All right. That, one question. Yes. This was in the application and. This does not mean anything, correct? It was just in there for some reason because th this line is totally. That's for orientation and review. That's okay. the, the GIS uh, borders can't be can't be trusted. That's why they have to produce. That's why you have to have an A to a survey yeah. like this to standards. And in fact, they're almost always very slightly off in my experience. Okay. Even well, evenly off across the entire map, which is. I'll end my spiel with I'm in favor of a seawall that protects his property and the rest of the, the road. Okay. And I just would not like to see it encroaching on any riparian things or our, or our own. Right. Well, I, all we're approving is everything within his property line. The only work he's authorized to do, and only because he received your permission, is to work in that shaded area Which to take out the rocks. He still has. <laughs> okay. okay. And I think we're all set. All right, are there any other questions or anybody else in the audience wishing? Well, sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Effectively, you're only removing rock, and the only place you're placing any rock is along the westerly property line. I mean, you're relocating the stone wall along Nick Road. You're removing the rock that's up far. You're removing the rock that's uh, right up against the mean high water line. How are you going to get to that rock? Uh, yep, the plan is there's enough room in between the driveway um, where you see these jeeps parked to get an excavator in there. Um, okay. Just like when they planted the rock, they're going to come out to this area in here where we have the tie line and be able to reach over. Reach over and yep, either with grappling hook or get underneath it and put the claw and pick it up. Okay. Um, they can either A, swing it and put it in this area that you see down in here okay. that was approved by DEP, mm -hmm. or they have the right to line that so, property line mm -hmm. um, with a certain standard that the has right. specified that you're under line. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, that's that is correct. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest with you, there's not that much rock that's that's coming out. Um, I don't think they're going to have the opportunity to, to bury any in their hair. Um, I think that once they start lining this, they're going to use up most of the rock. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor or against this application or have any questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll close this uh, particular application. Uh, the next item, Philip and Lauren Camp, we've received a request from the applicant to table that to March 5th, so I'll just ask for a motion to table this application to the 5th of March. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Okay, the Aye. next uh, item, Penelope Ives, 2158 Boston Post Road. Uh, I have to recuse myself since my property is on the border of this piece of property, or at least my rear property line abuts it. So I'll ask you, Walter, to take uh, over for this particular one. And yours does too, Frank. So I need to recuse myself. As a matter of fact, you, you're not only on the rear property line, but your sideline too. Yeah. 
So I'm the, the only four. remaining member of the executive committee. <laughs> well, one, two, three, you got four right, people. Got it. So you still have a quorum, so I, I do we have anyone to present? Very well. How are you doing? Adam Mines, 2180 Boston Post Road. I'm the son of the previous owner of the property uh, and under application. Um, in the late 90s, we had a garage built uh, separate to our uh, house. It was replacing a old shed. Um, we had proper building permits and Everything uh, tied up the red tape there. Uh, we had our certificate of occupancy issued, and we uh, moved forward with life. Uh, apparently, um, <clears throat> we had a complaint, an anonymous complaint filed at some point, saying that we had an illegal apartment operating above this two-story garage, um, which was completely untrue. Um, we were in the midst of selling our property uh, this just after the first of the year here, and <clears throat> because of that, I guess the uh, anonymous complaint had to have been uh, investigated. So Regina came, uh, investigated our second story of our garage to make sure there was no illegal apartment. Um, she found that there was no running water, no kitchen or bathroom hookups of any sort, um, <clears throat> but that we had changed the inside of the, of the room uh, slightly by closing in the walls with sheetrock, putting a drop ceiling, basically just making it a recreation and storage space which apparently our original CO did not allow for. Um, so we then had to make this application for a uh, special permit of accessory or use of accessory building as a recreational space. Now, <clears throat> what's very confusing is that we are no longer owners of the property. We've now sold, we closed exactly a week ago today. Uh, Chris Vayuso is now the owner of the property. We made the application, um, however, uh, as he was told to submit a letter saying that the application was allowed to go through in our name. According to Regina, that's what I had to do. Uh, I assume that that letter has not made it. Um, either it slipped through the cracks or... Um, <laughs> so I'm just kind of not sure what course of action we have here. Uh, now we are no longer the owners of the property, so how do we proceed? <laughs> uh, I spoke with the owner of uh, today. Exactly. Current owner. Yes. Allegedly current owner. Allegedly. Apparently current owner. I, I have never seen that be. Exactly, but I believe he is the current owner. Um, he's, like, he's in somewhere out California or somewhere out west. And he spoke to him on the phone today and he said that uh, you had his permission to present this application on his behalf. Oh, okay. Um, I asked him to send me an email uh, confirming that, which as of 30 I didn't have yet, uh, but uh, I will stipulate that he did verbally grant to me permission of the uh, I family members to present this application on his behalf. He has every, he has every reason to want to get it approved since he now owns the property. Right. And, uh, there wouldn't appear to be any reason why he would not want to, so uh, Do I'm we comfortable moving forward on that basis. So we have enough documentation. So we have enough documentation to move on this application this evening without a continuance? I believe you do. I mean, he gave me the verbal on, you know, I didn't see it in writing yet, but I believe he did give me the verbal on. In my opinion, that's accurate. Are there any questions from the public? You understand what the application is? Mm, it's I, creating I so. finished space. It's finished space in an accessory building. Right. I mean, I guess it's, is it heated? It was heated from the day okay. the CO no, was put no in. There's no plumbing there, there's no yeah. kitchen, so it's not like you can do anything illegal there. It's, it's the office idea. <coughs> it's like an office idea. Right. I don't yeah. know if they you even use it for anything. It's a storage and recreation. There's a TV and okay. kind of an escape from the man cave, so to speak, and sure. some storage. <laughs> okay. It's pretty uh, innocuous, actually. And all of the, all of the um, application fees are are in order. Yes. Uh, I'll entertain a motion from the commission to revise our agenda um, to vote here. Do we have to ask the public for questions? Yeah, yeah. it's a public hearing. Public hearing. 
Does anyone have any questions about the application? Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application? Anyone opposed to the application? Did this get noticed? Mm -hmm. Questions from commissioners? Like the letters to neighbors and things? The only thing I'm slightly concerned about is, is the uh, approval from the current homeowner. Only reason why, I mean, there's no absolutely no reason why you would come here and waste you know, your time, <laughs> you know, to, to do something sort of fraudulent. And there's no way, though, that we can, it's not like you've spoken to that individual, the current homeowner in the past, where you can verify that. Who he is? Him? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, no, I mean, you're, you're right. We're in a little bit of a weird. It just doesn't make any sense that that it would be anything else. And what would be the downside of granting it? Yeah. Well, is there some sort of higher tax? Well, I mean, who, usually you like to see something in writing, well, but you know that could be fraudulent too. So it's good. You, so if you're. you're uh, receipt this application. Does, is there any problem with? I guess it would be under it. So then should this name be different then for the motion? Um, should be under the well, name? We, the, uh, the applicant is still the uh, is still the LBI. It's the right. different, a different person can be the applicant. Anybody can yeah. in theory be the applicant right. on behalf of the owner. The owner in theory should sign the application. Right. But at the time, the owner didn't sign the application. That's just owner, that's it. Correct. It and we think we have an owner's permission to continue with this. We just right. don't know whether he was um, actually the owner or whether he was answered. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ives gave me the name and the phone number. I called him. He could can't be remember his, whether he answered. Could be his mother in law. <laughs> <phone. laughs> but they, but they, yeah. I said, hi, is this Mr. Bayuso? I forget his first name. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so first name said yes. And I said, I found the uh, who I was, and uh, explained the whole circumstance to him, and he said, okay, yeah, sure. And you've never me. spoken to Chris before? <laughs> he, uh, he, I've since learned that he is the owner or part of the, uh, of the family that owns the nursery over in Branford. Right. Right. So, so nursery I'm properties? Yeah. He's got the same family? Yeah, the same family. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like there's some... some and no the reason that this is a sig significant enough application um, for a public hearing is because it's after the fact. No, because no. it's a special permit. Because for, it's a special uh, permit. When you, finish, when you finish yeah. off an, a, an accessory structure, right? It's always a special permit. It's a special permit if it's right. going to be an office, if it's going to be a recreation, if it's going right. to be. Any number of those things, as long as it's not an accessory department, which is a separate section. And this has actually been this way for quite some time, I guess. Yeah, I so. mean, like I said, it, it, and as you all know, it used to be done with a, a bit more mm -hmm. um, cavalierness, I suppose, where if you, you know, you come in, we had the walls insulated from day one, from the time we were given our CO. The only note in the file said that the electrical was rudimentary at best and the walls should not be closed in, supposedly. Um, without some other, you know, electrical survey. So I guess that's where we're really running into a problem is that, you know, we <clears throat> So the CO is the reason why this is not grandfathered? Uh, the reason this isn't grandfathered is because they didn't get a special permit for human habitation and, access and so no accessory, what. detached accessory structure. So it will right. never be grandfathered. No 27336 just, says, says if yeah. you're going to have an office, a studio, guest accommodations, or an accessory apartment mm -hmm. in a detached accessory structure, you have to get a special permit from the commission. Okay. And, and it becomes a public hearing so that the neighbors can come in and weigh in on it if they choose to. In this case, right. the neighbors didn't have any problem. Any further questions? Fair enough. Right. Thank you very much. No and I will close the public hearing and we'll try to get our chairman back. <laughs> come back. <laughs> No, do you want to? Do you want us to? Oh, I'm just. I'm just going to revise the agenda, but. Skip it. All right. Um, if I can get a motion to approve the revised agenda. So moved. 
For a second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, first item uh, for consideration is a uh, bill. If I can get a motion on that, please. Uh, is that the That's the view. Okay, I voted. Um, that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a special permit application for David View, 521 State Street, Matt Eady, Lot 107A and B, for an accessory apartment in an existing detached building and guest accommodations in a corn crib, as shown on subsurface sewage disposal system design prepared for David View, dated 11-14-13, revised 11-15-13, prepared by Thomas A. Stevens and Associates, Inc., and floor plan prepared by the applicant and as heard at a public hearing on January 15th, 2014 and February 19th, 2014. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, discussion. Uh, what about the, the Was the last part the application approved based upon a fine that conforms to 273.36? Oh. Okay, yeah, I'll yeah, okay. amend, I'll that amend motion. my yeah, motion. This application is approved based upon a finding that it conforms with 273.36 and 273.19 of the zoning code. The special permit is effective on February 28, 2014, <coughs> and upon filing with the town clerk. Okay, I'll ask for a re second. Second to be amended. Okay, discussion. Uh, we we have to approve this. This um, the, the only two. Um, concerns raised were um, Mr. View's occupation and the related concern of his legal associations. Um, therefore, we have no grounds whatsoever to um, deny this application um, because of his constitutional rights. Uh, he also oh. did represent that this was for his own personal use, that this mm -hmm. is not for a business or a commercial Correct. type use, and, I, and he did indicate that he understood if he wanted to make a change to that, it was necessary to come back before this commission. And we would just, uh, you know, tell the neighbors to be vigilant, and if they suspect that this uh, is not what, it, what has been approved here, then they should bring a complaint to Reggie and it will be investigated. Any other uh, discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, that's carried. Next uh, item, if I could please get a motion for the Brooks Landing LLC application. Uh, proposed motion voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a coastal site plan application for Brooks Landing LLC Map 2, Lot 24, as shown on an application dated in November 12, 2014. <coughs> Um, is that supposed to be 2013? Yeah. I'm going to say 2014. Oh, 14? Well, that's going to be a problem since it hasn't happened yet, right? I think no. it's, uh, the application was probably dated 2013, yeah. November 12th. I'll yeah. go with 2013. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sure, well, and as heard at a public hearing on February 19th, 2014, this application, uh, well, no, um, uh, Condition. So this application is approved based upon a finding that it conforms with the zoning code and is consistent with the coastal management policies of the state of Connecticut. Okay, do I hear a second? No seconds. Second. <laughs> okay, discussion. It is dated, for the record, the uh, application is dated November 12, 2013. <coughs> All right, so the motion is correct. It was just the writing that was incorrect. All right, uh, discussion. Oh, it seems pretty state straightforward. It just right. It's just retroactive. Retroactive appears to be a minor change to just restore what was there previously. There aren't supposed to be fees associated with something retroactive like this, are there? Penalties. For fine, yeah, penalties. Yeah. Is there usually a no? No. no. No, I mean, building we use permits. for building permit where you conduct the work without a building permit, the fine is double. I mean, yeah. the permit fee is double. Okay. Not, not for zoning applications. Okay. Any further discussion on this application? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the James Sparrow application at 120 Neck Road, if I could please get a motion. Um, voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a coastal area <laughs> management site plan for James Barrow 120 Neck Road, map 25, lot 4, shown on CAM application prepared for 
James <coughs> Morgaro, prepared by Harkin Engineering LLC, dated 11714, um, revised. <coughs> I don't know what that is. I'm just gonna dated. 11714. This application is approved based upon a finding that it conforms with the zoning code and is consistent with the coastal area management policies of the state of Connecticut. Okay, thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, thanks. Was this revised past the 17th by chance, or is that the last application that? Uh, 211 of 14. 211. Okay, right, so that I'll, was revised yes. to. Revi I'll amend my. Motion to say revised to 211 2014. Okay, and you're okay with three seconding that. Okay, good. So that's what we're talking about and approving. Uh, discussion. The part that we're responsible for approving is clearly in order. Um, and it, it looks like the application is also in order, but. Um, I'm confident that the area that's under our review um, is being handled appropriately. Right, and then to the extent that there is work that's outside the borders of this property, the owner of that property did uh, make a representation at this meeting that he was okay, him and his, his wife, I suppose, were okay with that particular uh, activity taking place in his property so with that I'm, I'm fine that's, since that's on the record all right any further discussion they said that other permits needed to be pulled uh, you know along this road the DEP yeah. the permission so is there any sort of order that we should be not order but is there anything we should be waiting on before we we move forward with this well we we could it make it a condition that prior to any of the work beginning that's been approved here that the necessary state applications also be but well, wouldn't that be on the state jurisdiction area yes it would be yes yeah. it would be we, we can't grant it or not grant it but uh if you want you can make that a, could I, suppose, I a condition interject mm -hmm. there is a state enforcement <coughs> action on the property at the moment oh okay he has to by april 1st i believe remove what they're telling him to remove that was put in their on their property without permission. Okay. So, so if you that's put that condition on, that's oh, gonna It's going to tie them up. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, then I'm fine with what's being done in, within our jurisdiction to the extent he wants Correct. to do the work in the state area. He'll have to wait till he gets the state approval to do that. Yeah, we don't want But in the meantime, he has no, to No, we do don't want to hold him up. He has to do what their enforcement right. action is. We don't he has to remove an what they told him to remove. Right, an impossible position that he can't, uh, can't meet. Okay. We don't want to lock up or confuse the state enforcement situation. No. Any no. more than it already is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> all right. Uh, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Uh, why don't you take this one then? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Put the motion in. Uh, Frank sure. and I will not be voting on this. We're discussing it. Okay. Um, let the record reflect that the chairman and Commissioner DeAndrea have recused themselves from this vote. Um, I'm going to make this motion. Voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a special permit for Penelope Ives at 2158 Boston Post Road, map 78, lot 9, for a recreation area in a detached structure, as shown in an application dated January 16, 2014, and as heard at a public hearing on February 19, 2014. Uh, this application is approved with no conditions. This application is approved based upon a finding that it conforms with the zoning code. The special permit is effective on February 28, 2014, and upon filing with the town clerk. Second. Do we have any questions about that February 28th effective date? Is that just the soonest that? That's when it would be. The notice would be published. That's the appropriate. That's where the publication. <coughs> Discussion? Uh, I got a question, actually. Mm -hmm. He mentioned that he has um, questionable electrical service we're approving a permit for them to do the work retroactively correct do they need to to have an electrical inspection to make sure it's safe or we're, d we're doing we're giving them the special permit which is a zoning permit that's it. building department is so this still has to go through the building i don't know the status of whether the building department is not going to 
issue a CFO. They may not bother to get a CFO if they don't want to. So they don't need a CFO. They don't need a CFO because it's, it's, it's not, not our living concern. space. Not, you don't have any jurisdiction over that. All right. Yeah. I, my only concern is who, you know, is the representative. If, if the homeowner, the now homeowner, doesn't necessarily want to have this permit for whatever reason. I know they're sort of mm -hmm. required to you know, have a What would the downside be? I have no idea. If they don't want this, you mean? Yeah. They I mean, don't have to file it. Yeah. I, okay. They could just take the special permit and throw it away. It's okay. not effective until it's filed in the, by the, in the land records, and the owner has to do that filing. I um, I just Again, they concerned. told me they do want it, so. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine why they <laughs> It's not a homeowner, by the way. This is an investor, uh, yeah. investor on property. Yeah. So there's one more backstop for the um, for the current owner. Yeah. I'm sure it makes sense to want it, but I would be concerned. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous. Okay. Thank you for handling Sorry, that. The, we'll right on to the site plan applications this evening. The first one is uh, Michael. In Terrary, this is 995 Boston Post Road, site plan revision uh, to revise the planting plan for this property. Uh, if I can get a motion to receive it. So moved. Mm -hmm. a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, is someone presenting this, George? Do you know? All right. right. I will. Um, this is an application for 995 Boston Post Road. It's on the corner of State Street and Boston Post Road. They have some uh, trees in the front that were damaged during uh, hurricane and winter storms. And it's on the west corner. Northwest. 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 Okay. And the current owner wants to remove the damaged trees and replace them. They did go to the design review committee, and the design review committee, uh, after some back and forth, uh, uh, got the owner to uh, change a little bit of his plan so that it would be more in keeping with the Boston Post Road properties with street trees. The tree warden has written a memo for you and uh, in his memo, um, he says that uh, he agrees with the uh, site, uh, site plan that Mr. Interney has presented to you. Um, they're going to replant five trees to replace eight existing trees. And these new trees will be appropriately spaced. Uh, the, evidently, the old the trees that were there were too close together, and was part of the reason why they became damaged. They are leaving um, a nice dogwood tree that was on the corner of Straight, State Street and Boston Post Road. That's going to stay in place, and uh, they are going to plant uh, trees along State Street, which is uh, in the historic district, and the historic district. Commission's Chairman John Cunningham, who's also a landscape architect, um, agreed that the maple trees would look and grow very well on that side. And it'll keep that part of the street looking the way it has been. Okay. So my recommendation is that the Commission approve this application. As it's presented, he wants to start planting in the spring. All right. Um, are there any questions of Reggie? Is the Historic District Commission going to have to take action on this as well? They already looked at it. They already did. I don't think they have to have a permit to plant trees in the Historic District. Though, no, but we but asked they them on it. Yeah. because of it right. bordering the Historic District. They didn't refer it favorably or anything else. They just No, they didn't have to make an application to them because that side of the street is not in the district, but the other side of the street is. Uh, but we asked them to weigh in on it because we wanted to make sure, and so did the tree warden, that that corridor of State Street remained looking the way it was. Okay. Any other questions for Reg? If not, I'll ask someone to please read a motion. Motion. 
voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a site plan revision for Michael and Treary at 995 Boston Post Road, mm. Map 46, Lot 125, as shown on an application dated 11414. This application is approved with the condition that the recommendations of the De Design Review Committee made at their meeting on November 13, 2013 be followed. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, pretty straightforward. Seems like we got agreement between design review, the CEO, and the applicant. So it sounds like we're good and to go. And the tree warden. Tree warden as well. Yeah. And slash environmental planner. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all favor? Okay. Anybody opposed? All right. Moving along, uh, Russo Real Estate, One Shoreline Drive, site plan revision to revise the dumpster location and to add a chain link. Uh, fence for storage, receive and take action. If I can get a motion to receive. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Good evening for the record. Bob Crispello, engineer for Russo Real Estate. Um, and I brought with me my A2 survey, and it's um, where the old postal service is, right in this area. This is uh, Soundview, and this is Shoreline Drive at the very end. Uh, this is a 9.4 acre parcel of land. The building, the existing building, is about 72,000 square feet, it has about 86 cars parked around it, and there are a series of loading docks and loading bays around the building. And the application is not a very um, good one. It's, it will make the property a lot better. What you find if you went to the site, if I may do this, um, there are dumpsters uh, around the building and they do not have enclosures. And this application is all about locating enclosures and, in, and constructing four enclosures to have the dumpsters uh, be well screened. And, and those locations would be along the north side of the building and two on the east side and then one on the southwest. So that's basically the majority of the application. This dumpster right here to service these loading bays took up three parking spaces. So we are relocating three spaces in a paved area on the east side of the site. One more component of the application is there is a landscape contractor here behind the dumpster he would like to utilize a proposed fenced-in area, which would be about 10 by 20. So that really kind of sums it up. And I'm here to answer Are there um, any residential no. areas around there? Okay, so noise oh, wouldn't be a problem with the truck coming that in. That is correct. This is a, a wetland down in here. Okay. These are commercial properties and the same across the street. Okay, good. And then the train tracks are to the south, another? Yes. Please. Yes. Um, on the other side yeah. of the wetland. Yeah, the other side of the wetland. Yes. Hey, other questions? Is outside the wetland review area? Yes. Mm -hmm. All within the paved area adjacent to the building. And not within 100 feet of the wetland? Um, to the best of my knowledge, I think the wetland is adjacent to the pond from mappings that I've seen. Um, we did not do a detailed wetland soil mapping of that area. We don't have a referral to them though, because the, do Is it, well, if it's within 100 feet same. of a wetland and he's doing work, one would think. Are you within, how far are you from I that? really can't answer that question because that hasn't been discussed. There's been, by my firm, no mapping of the inland wetlands. I have located it on in the area, so obviously that's a wetland area, and that's why it's undeveloped. Um, um, so using the scale of your A1 hey. survey. Yeah. And that's where the pond is, but the wetland could it. be. We can't answer it unless we go back to our wetland file on this property. It, it certainly is. More than 100 feet away from the edge of the pond. It's right, so whether there's wetland soils. Mm. I don't know. Um, I can't answer that. No. If you had the file, would you be able to answer it? Yes. Okay. 
if we continue this to the next meeting, is that going to be a no problem? Okay. Why don't we to just make sure we're following all the rules? Uh, Reg, if the town staff could check that. And then we'll look if, at it tomorrow morning. Yeah, and if it's an issue, advise the applicant so they, I don't know, what, what would they need you to go to in the wetlands or if uh, they're within 100 feet? Well, it's small enough that it would be a staff approval. Okay. So as long as. Because it, staff is allowed to approve um, structures, anything that's 350 square feet or less. Okay. After the, anything more than that goes to the commission. Okay, good. So you would calculate that it's a staff approval because those four dumpsters in aggregate are less than 350 square feet? Well, the only one that's wow. close is the one on that corner of the building. Just the that one. Clearly further away. Yeah, that's right. 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 Ten more. Right. 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 We all paved the area. Um, I'm just going to answer your question. I apologize. That's okay. Sorry. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't uh, we get a motion to continue the application to March 5th for the purposes of determining if uh, wetlands review is required and if so we'll let that process play out and if you can staff can approve it then we'll just take this up at the next meeting okay uh, can I get a motion to that effect so moved we'll here a second second all favor <coughs> okay we'll move that one off okay let me get to the next page here uh, next one is big Y supermarket 850 Boston Post Road this is a revision to the site plan additional propane tank cage in front of store to be provided by Pinnacle Propane Express for storage of small propane tanks for sale. It's about property of Guilford Plaza Associates LTD, also known as Brook Properties. Uh, we need to receive and take action, so I'll ask for a motion to receive. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Who will be presenting? I'm with Pinnacle Propane. I'm with the officers. And our compliance department's been dealing with Reggie. Um, Can you switch your name? I'm Scott Klein. I'm sorry, your address, sir? I'm just for the, for the record. I'm here with Pinnacle Propane. Okay. And where's that located? Uh, well, we're located in Chicago. We're located nationwide. Okay. So, um, with Third Lines Propane Fire. Um, what we're trying to do here is uh, just add a cage for additional inventory. Um, we've uh, done the drawings. Um, we've done the drawings of the cages of the site plan and also of the, the barriers we put up, the additional barriers. It's a uh, big west come to us to add an additional cage for inventory um, to be able to sell propane. Okay, so. How many more things? Uh, 50. 50. 54. One cage. An additional cage. And, uh, They're all self-contained, all locked, uh, all protected. All we would do is drop an additional couple of jersey barriers in front of them. In these cases, also. We uh, we did uh, we did get design review approval of this, right? Yes. Yes. And we did receive a letter in the file, which I'm going to read into the record from Ken McKenzie, dated Wednesday, February 19th. Uh, note that item B3 in tonight's agenda is to increase the size of retail propane tank storage for sale in front of the Big Y, courtesy of Pinnacle Propane Express. Fortunately, I do not see many people going to Big Y for propane, but does it really make sense to encourage people to drive around the Big Y parking lot with propane canisters in their vehicle? When I go to refill my grill tank, I never take a passenger. I secure it carefully and I bring it straight home. The ease with which we let people distribute this material is concerning. I have not decided whether I will attend the meeting. The apparent lack of public concern over the safety and distribution of propane is one of the reasons why JJS is able to get so far along in their push for bulk storage. Opponents argue that accidents are quite rare, which may be true. What is also true, however, is that they can be catastrophic. Chairs can. Okay. Discuss. I did. I'd like to point out. Also, I discussed this uh, project this afternoon with the fire marshal or the assistant fire chief. I guess is his title, Wayne Dietrich. He asked that uh, should, if the commission approves this before this is installed, that the applicant review their plans with the uh, fire department. Yeah. Okay. Did, so, according to so does Big Y because from his letter, from Ken's letter here. Increase the size of the retail propane tank storage. So, are they currently? 
They currently sell them. They currently sell. They currently have cage. Okay, I didn't even know and, that. And the reason why they want to add another cage is, is because they sell so much. <laughs> okay, so we we <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't be coming here asking for to put another cage yeah. down. So it's going, so it's, there's Sorry. one, so these two blocked out squares, one is already existent, right? Right. And then one is the proposed, same size? Same size. So currently there's space for 54, and now there will be another. It, it, yeah, it's exactly the same size, uh, all, all by government, and, and actually international code we go by, which is more stringent. So, so it has to be a certain distance from doorways, has to be a certain distance from parking lots, has to be protected by Jersey barriers, so it, it's, it's well protected from any type of. I, I got a question. For you. Yes. How do you how do you regulate or keep people away from smoking near this tank, or near these tanks? Well, and, and the reason yeah, I ask I, is same thing with with filling your gas tank. It's it's not not an easy thing to do. It's it's the company itself or uh, telling their employees not to smoke. I mean, we have big signage on our cages and stuff, but yeah, I think actually big one. Plaza has a sign that says, thou shalt not smoke on the property. Okay, I think you're right, but I have seen some of their employees step outside and have a cigarette, and it's right near where these tanks are. It's right by the exit door, mm -hmm. by the gumball machines. Well, but I'm sure the fire marshal, now, well, let me ask this first. If, one of the conditions, George, is that the town fire marshal wants to review and approve the plan yes. prior to allowing, so we want to make that a condition. Yes. But to the extent that that smoking area needs to move, that's within the town fire marshal's jurisdiction to be able to tell a bit why. I assume so, I don't know. It's certainly yeah. not anything that's under zoning jurisdiction. No, no, but I'm just saying for the safety concerns, you know, you raise a good point. Just want to make sure that if that needs to move, the applicant's aware of it. I, mean, I don't know if it's, there's a regulation that says you got to be, you can't smoke within 50 feet of these, or, or well, the, the just want to make sure it's The reason it's I ask is that this so. is a lot closer to the exit door um, than the existing Cage. Mm -hmm. So it puts it closer to the area where customers will leave the store, and if they are smokers, they will light up right away. I, I'm concerned about, you know, a tank that might not have its valve shut all the way. There might be a little venting. Sometimes the smell will. Yes. Uh, number one, you can't even if a valve is open, it can't release emissions. That's part of the safety factor mm -hmm. on all tanks. Um, you can open up your tank, and it cannot emit anything. It has to have physically. A connection, a female male connection, to force the fuel out. Okay. So that that's that's all built in safety factors of those tanks. That's government regulated. Yeah, so. I'm aware. I have uh, I operate forklifts at my business. Okay. We have tanks that have that safety feature that leak anyway. That's why mm -hmm. I say that. Okay. The, you're actually this application is actually for one single cage and one single additional Jersey it's barrier. The, it's in front just of it. to add an additional cage with with Jersey barrier. I, I'll add that the original cage was never approved. Well, it was uh, installed never approved. without site plan approval. Oh. So, so then the site plan is to get to conform the first one and to add a second one. Okay. That's different. But there's yeah. another property like that. Yeah, there is. How far away did you say they had to be from the doors? Well, it depends on what code you go by. Well, what code are you? Uh, we go by international. They can, they can be anywhere from 30 to 50 feet. Mm -hmm. How many feet is this going to be? Um, I, I haven't been there, so I can not tell you. I know it's under international code, so. So it's going to be at least 30. It's going to be the furthest distance that it has to be. Now, would that, that would be in the purview. Of, I mean, even if we approve this, if they're not meeting the code, the fire marshal would have the ability to oh, definitely. keep six oh, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is uh, this is retail sales of merchandise, which is the use that's being it's the sale here. This has nothing to do with propane storage or anything right. like that. This is a retail store and one of the things they sell is and that's do a, is and that's a permitted we permit that. Yes, we don't specifically stuff. list all the things you can sell in a retail store. So 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 what is it that we have in like uh, Reggie just said that they're it's not permitted yet. Or they, well, they, they didn't get per, they didn't part get part site plan it. approval for the first cage evidently. So in other words, when when Walmart comes to us because they want to sell fertilizer outside, they clearly yeah. come in. They right. never did any of that, so technically they're in violation. So we would just be adding to the deficiency or the non-compliance. We'd be clearing if they're not compliant if we approve this. 
I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. So if they've never came in for approval, right? So when Walmart comes to us, I'm using that as an example because it just happened last summer. They came to sell the fertilizer, some plants outside, right. yeah. because they wanted to technically add to their retail space because they're now using part of the sidewalk. Right, right, right. right. So this increases the retail So and they came and they got their special permit. They got their what, variant site special plan. permit, site plan approval. They never did this for the first one. Right. So technically they're in violation, right? Right. So how could we approve something that hasn't even been... Well, it's up to you. You're the commission. That's Our what we normally do. Is you have the ability we to... We ask people to, if, the, if we find a zoning violation, we ask them to address the zoning violation by making the proper... This is the exact same thing that we just did for the people moving the rocks. Right. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, some of this is judgment in the sense that if it was an intentional kind of a thing to try to get around the regulations, we take a much dimmer view of that than... Based on our defense, or negligent. We, we took over the Big Y account uh, two, two years ago. Uh -huh. Prior to that, um, Blue Rhino had the account. Um, Big Y hands us a, a store list with their inventories at all their stores, and that's how we decide how to set our propane. So the propane was already there before we even came, so that's how we would not even know if there was a zoning issue or not. We, were here we assumed already that it was already approved before we were to put our cases down. Is, um, is Big Y and or Walmart for that matter, are both of them bumping up against the, the maximum size of their stores? I vaguely uh, remember No, not, not Big Y. And Big Y has approval from the commission for 50 linear feet of outdoor display of merchandise. 15? And 50. 50. 50. 50. Walmart is at the maximum size okay, that they so whatever they be. want to put outside there. They present. have to come to you. Then they also have to get a variance. Mm -hmm. Big Y has approval for 50 linear feet of outdoor display of merchandise. Okay. This would fit into that 50 feet of okay. outdoor display area, but because they wanted to put an additional tank, mm -hmm. we require them to submit an application to the commission for, okay. for site and plan and approval. Site plan. Okay, 50 linear feet. So this is cutting into their pumpkin yeah. outdoor display yeah. and yeah. other outdoor display potentially? Mm -hmm. That's right, if they go over 50, they'll need a variance or they'll need, if they can even they get need one, to I don't come know, back. or come back. And then well, once again, if, if, this, if, the, if these tanks can't be the minimum distance away from either of the exit doors, at all, the fire marshal could at any time say, "All right, enough." Oh yeah, he does. He would. He would now call us in a heartbeat. Um, Ray, does it make sense to approve it with the condition that the fire marshal approve, or does it make sense to find out what the fire marshal has to say before we approve a site plan? Well, here's here's what I'm thinking: is something like the town fire marshal shall review and approve the plan prior to the installation of. Any, any additional propane cages. That's what I've talked to the fire marshal about today, or the system fire. So that, he will that. not be, so what we're approving is the site plan here. Now if he says, no, it's not going there, it's going here, I think they need to come back and get the site plan approved by us again because of a safety concern. So if he's saying, no, this one's too okay. close. Yeah, yeah, that's my yeah. concern is that if yep. he says, no, move it 50 feet to the left. Then this site plan, is now what's been approved, so he'll I think they'll have to come back here for that makes sense. approval. And then also, uh, just to indicate, there's also a condition here that a minimum of three feet of clearance for pedestrian yes. use be maintained on the walkway. You're familiar yes. with that, yeah. if you're okay with that condition. Okay. Any, any other questions from the commission? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion. Um, I move have. to continue to. Um, to our next regular meeting oh, uh, for review. Wait, what are we continuing? This motion? Uh, yeah, I'd like to move to continue this to our next regular meeting. It looks it looks fine to me. I was just uh, surprised by a number of aspects of this, so I just want to look into it at first. Uh, what specifically? What? Um, yeah, the, well, the distances from the uh, exit, from uh, between the cages, the fact that the first, um, the condition of the first cage that was never approved, as well as the um, the cinder block and 
plywood stands that they usually put out, um, they may have been allowing for three feet of clearance for most of the space before. Uh, but I shop there pretty often, and I. Um, isn't yeah? I just need the to. Isn't the fire marshal on? I mean, figure yeah. that part of stuff out. When we draw the drawings, we have something physically go out and measure. But I mean, I'm not too worried. And the fire marshal. Fire marshal. Yeah, and will tell us if it's out of code or not. You know, I, I, I value the, the candor. I just think that. Um, this doubles the size of a use that's not currently permitted. And as much as Pinnacle is here, has only been here for two years, Big Y has been here for a long time, and they're you know, responsible for the current and future condition. Well, I mean, it, condition. it sounds more like you're not in favor of granting it as opposed to continuing it. I haven't seen um, the layout. So, uh, in general, I think that an extra cage is probably fine. Um, but I'm, but without a continuance, I don't think that we have enough. Well, what uh, what would we, we ask the applicant or someone to bring to the next meeting, specifically, so that you you know you would feel comfortable about making the decision? Uh, well, it would be more about review of. For instance, the current big Y layout. Um, well, we've had problems before where we didn't know what we were looking for on some sensitive applications. Um, well, I mean, they're showing us where they're going to put it right here. They have 50 feet. Is they can't go scale? beyond the 50 feet. Is this to scale? I mean, I'm, this I'm is looking at this, this is not an A2. If the oh, no, no, it isn't. I mean, this is just, you know, graph paper, which is, you know, I mean, it, it could scale. be fine, but, but, you know, Given that it's a dangerous thing, maybe a wealth of concern and worry uh, would be to, to get I mean, a better drawing. The, the certainly, I mean, obviously it's a hazardous material, but the the risk um, the risk factor is mitigated by the things that are on this sheet. I just think that we need to review. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying that the applicant has has. Misrepresented anything. I just wanted to. Oh, that's what I'm trying to get at. Is exactly life. what is it that you want to have here? Well, it's one of the things that it would also provide us with is the opportunity for the fire marshal to affirmatively weigh in and and be able to yeah. say yes, it has the minimum distances. Yes, I'm confident that smoking is not going to happen, or that smoking is that you know signs are posted saying that you know don't don't do the following. I think if you. Um, <coughs> Hold it over for another meeting that you'll have the opportunity to get that input. Well, from the maybe get the fire marshal approval. Yeah, I don't have a problem. I'm just saying, is there anything beyond that? I just want to, what I don't want to have happen is that the applicant come back next time and sit and we say, well, you know, we really wanted this and that. And he or she was not clear what we're asking for in addition to the fire marshal's approval. Well, okay, so then again, the size of the cage is three, three feet by 20 feet or 80 inches long. By 27 by 72. Right. So that would still be within the staff approval size for something within 100 feet of a wetland, because that area is within 100 feet of a wetland, too. Right. right back of the store is all wetlands. It's only 20 feet off the back of the store is a wetland. Yeah, directly behind Shoreline Plaza is all wetlands. Okay. I, I've been there. I know it. Lineage. We've been on lots of wetland surveys there. You is, that a, is that considered a structure, though? Or? I don't, I don't even think that yeah. it's so tiny yeah. that doesn't it's a staff approval and so. but, okay. but Walter would you if, if the fire marshal were here and he said that he approves everything that is being presented would you then have any further problems with it uh, no I mean the, all of my regular checklist it works out except that usually with hazard I mean with a hazardous material it would be better to actually review it Across a second meeting, uh, I'm just, I just. Well, I'm, I'm, again, I just want to make sure we're not in the same place the second meeting. If right, so there's you something want the you want, marshal. let the applicant know what it is. So the fire not, marshal would be good. Okay, but, so, so if that's, that's all you that's want. That's all you yeah. want. If he, if the fire marshal approves I mean, this, then you have enough material to to make a judgment. I mean, there's no. I don't think that there's much that we would be able to vary on this because it's a retail space. It's, sort of a retail product and we don't have any way to 
just start saying, oh, you can't sell this here. I that's, been, that's not, that's not, I haven't that's reviewed the existing cage. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, I don't know what the status for the existing cage is. So there's no differentiation between selling protein and selling bread? Okay. Not, 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 not for not, not right land use retail. Retail. Not for this. Now, this there is certainly is, is in terms of safety and what right. restrictions that the fire marshal would want for the two types right. of material. But in terms of land use, I don't think so. It's a retail use the way the zoning code is written. Right. I, I, the only I mean, I don't have a problem continuing it, and it's probably a good idea to get the approval of the fire marshal to make sure that's worked out in case this does have to move around or zig or zag. I just want to make sure that when the applicant comes back, we have the material. If, if, if we want something more of the applicant, they are made aware of it tonight so that when they do come back, they can provide that material and we don't keep, you know, moving the, right. the goalposts yeah, goal a little bit further down the field. So, so that's my I only concern. That, from yeah. Chicago. <laughs> Yeah, I know. This time they don't have anyone local. FYI. I thought they were nationwide. Well, we are nationwide. I'm one of the officers, but uh, this is a big deal, and you just don't let gotcha. anybody do this. Good. Well, no, that makes sense. <laughs> so, so let I, me. I guess I'm trying to show that the yeah, fire marshal is, you know. Well, let me just ask this then. Is there anything besides the fire marshal's approval that the commission is asking for? Well, in, in light of the fact that he flew in from Chicago, should we consider it's approving this? So that's okay. That's it. With the fire marshal's approval, this way he doesn't have to fly back and forth. Would you be okay with it just being approved well, contingent? I'm not, I'm not sure if the applicant needs to be here again. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to be here. Again. I just need to. Um, yeah, well, I'll send it. I'll, I'll, you know, if we get this far, I'll, I'll ask Big Y to send one of their guys here, so at least this representation, you know, or I can have one of my compliance people come out after the fact here. It, I've just never reviewed this cage. I mean, I've walked by it all the time. I, yeah, I walked by it too. But I've never what, looked what, at it. I guess, what's your question on the cage? Uh, well, currently it is, um, it's not an approved use, right? No, it is approved. It is approved. It's, the use? The, it's the structure is not approved. But we're approving Revision right. of the site plan. Revision just the site plan to show those cages. There the first is cage should have been approved for outside storage, but it was never specified, I guess is the case, that there would be this cage thing. Right. So. And, in com and with the garden um, the, section. Uh, the garden display, which is That's part of the cinder blocks. 50 linear feet of Correct. outdoor display. If if, the, sure, go ahead. No, yeah, so that's typically cinder blocks and bricks holding down plywood planks. Yeah, they always have plants on it, though, around the holidays. They have well, the, the point is, I think, they only have 50 feet to play with, and if right. they put these two in, that subtracts from the 50 feet for anything else they want to put there. And this is clearly within that. Right, yeah. if I remember right, this was directly in front of the propane tank uh, shed. You know, the, the sheds are up against the glass windows, then mm -hmm. there's a little walk space, and then they had what looked like at least 50 feet of right. flowers hanging in front of it. So is that all just 50 feet from this, you know, like, is it an addition to the propane storage shed, or does that not count because there's other stuff in front of it? I mean, I, I know it's a boring site visit, but it's, it seems like it's appropriate. Well. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's I mean, I could say visit this by accident, but uh, yeah. Well, they still have to provide the three foot pedestrian clearance. So, Correct. wherever they put this thing, if they try to put something in front of it and there's not three feet of pedestrian clearance, they're out of luck. That's and it's 50 feet. And if this is in the same line as everything else, that subtracts from it. Can't go beyond 50 feet and 10. I mean, I think if the only thing we're really looking for is the town fire marshal approval, whether we approve it first with a condition that they have to approve it, or they approve it, and then we just come back here and say, yep, they approved it, or I'm okay. Yeah. It, I would just be in favor of moving the process along tonight with the condition saying that they need to get that review and approval before they can actually install any of these things. But I'll leave it up to... Right, well, the, yeah, the motion right, right, right now is, is for yeah. the continuance. It's, it's one of those things that we've walked past it a hundred times and I've never noticed it. Yeah, right. Or I've never looked at it. I may as well. Right. I may as well know what I'm talking about before it's I go on it, I think. That's really what I'm Just thinking. Of it. Yeah. 
All right, so is there a second to the motion to continue this? Great to be here. Okay, any discussion? Okay, who's in favor of continuing it? Okay, who's in favor of not? Okay, so we'll continue it, and just so that we're clear, what else are we asking the... Just the fire marshal. Just the fire marshal. Fire marshal, fire marshal. So we all didn't have to do our own individual site visit. For okay. So I have a fire marshal's written letter statement. We want him sure. to review and approve the plan, and if he could just put that approval in writing and send it to us, we'll yeah, take it in there. Yeah, whatever the distances are from... And then the next process is Good. All right, you all set? Thank you. I don't think we're going to require the applicant back here. No. I'll come no. back. Okay. <laughs> you like this? You, want the you like this? Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's continued. Let's move Easy. on to Thank you. Uh, Town of Guilford, Nut Plains Road. This is a site plan revision for the installation of a scoreboard. Uh, can I get a motion to receive that? So moved. moved. Oh. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor, aye. Aye. Okay, George, you presenting? Yes, I am. I think you all have this. Uh, this uh, Green piece, piece of paper mm -hmm. that shows the uh, Nut Plains Field. Um, if you know where that is, it's off of uh, Nut Plains Road. Dome Avenue is along the, uh, I guess it's actually the northern property line there. You see the uh, uh, proposed location of the, the uh, uh, scoreboard is the little black triangle kind of in the lower right hand corner there. It's also shown the relationship between the scoreboard and the electric power on the street. Uh, on the, uh, you have another piece of paper I think shows what the scoreboard will actually look like. Towards the upper, uh, the upper version, it's not going to have the side panel with sponsors. Um, it's only the scoreboard itself. It has no sponsors. That's what I'm told. An opportunity to make some money here. Right. We're uh, a classy town. <laughs> that's, uh, that's it. That's what it looks like. Cool paper. This is a you know, whole thing. Pup, this is a town-owned facility. Obviously, this is no closer to anyone's home. Uh, I don't see any houses on this uh, on this aerial photograph. There are some homes over here on Dome Avenue. As you can see. Is this? Um, I, I'm very familiar with this place. This is the Chestnut Orchard. Is in back of this. Yes. And, um, you know, is this addition of the scoreboard going to encourage more and more use of this where it might impact the neighbors? Or would I have to worry about that? I can't, I don't, I can't answer that. I think this, this field is used as a, is it lacrosse uh, primarily? I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know what kind of sport is actually taking place. Which there. field is this? Uh, Nut Plains Park. That's the, it's, yeah, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's just up It's, um, I don't know what kind of sporting activity takes place there. Looking, it's not, you know, looking at this, I can tell that it's not football, it's not baseball. Could be, it could be soccer. And anytime I've been there, it's been deserted, and that, you know, it seemed nice for the neighbors to have that. Well, it's deserted, but I'm worried that with the addition of this, um, Is this uh, I, 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 I don't know. I think these lines are cross lines if they're right on the page. For some reason, I want to say this is lacrosse. I think these lines are lacrosse lines if this is really what it usually looks like. So I can't really say. See the two little dots where the goals are? Yeah. I, I guess my question is, you know, do the neighbors have any expectation that it's not going to grow or are we encouraging it to grow? With a scoreboard, or you're right. I, don't, I don't think a scoreboard would make or of course we could facility grow. I think if they were looking for yeah. concession yeah. stands. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I think yeah. that might. Oh, look at that. That's that's a, a, it that's doesn't appear that from from the if you know the property, is there is there any kind of seating or stadium or no, there anything like that? Oh, it says lacrosse. No. Yeah. I don't think so. That I didn't read. One would wonder how many people. Well, again, you know, whether this is a wise use of the taxpayers' dollars or is this going to... I think some, I don't think the town's paying for this. I think there's a private uh, donation of some kind. Oh, okay. So it's really a land use question. And it's facing away from the neighborhood. It's facing toward the cemetery. All right, so it's not it's facing towards the residential area of the lights. And the no, they, you know it's an area angle. Well, I'm sure it's only lit during the game. Mm-hmm. 
That's that's pretty much what I know about. All right. Is there are there any other questions for George or Reg on this? No. If not, oh, I'm sorry. Do you do you have any? If not, why don't we get a motion and then we can discuss it? Voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a site plan revision for the installation of a scoreboard at Nut Plains Park as shown on an application dated 12 4 13. This application is approved based on a finding that it conforms with the zoning code. Hey, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, discussion. Well, I think uh, the good news is that it's angled in a way that it's away from the residential area. Um, how far back is it set from, from the road? Can you tell, George, from the... It's at the back of the park. Yeah, so yeah, I, mean, I, don't I don't think it's going to be much of this a This little drawing says it's about 50 or 60 uh, yards traffic. from the telephone pole, which would be right on on Dome 150 Avenue. feet, to okay. 200 so. feet. Are, the, are they digging and like bearing cable and wiring? That's what it looks like. That's what they say. Yeah, it looks like the control cable and the AC to it are buried. Uh, and there's no uh, wetlands issues here? I don't know. No, not with this one. No? All the wetlands are on the uh, other side. Uh, this field is wide. Yeah. The damage is already done because the field got put in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other discussion on it or any other comments that anyone would like to make? No. Okay, hearing that, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. We don't get to vote on the color. No, no, I guess not. We can make a recommendation. Make a recommendation. <laughs> right. Uh, we have a number of applications to be received, so we'll start with the special permits. Mara Weissman, 117 Andrews Road, special permit for guest accommodation and an accessory structure, and use of a cottage as a temporary seasonal residence during home construction. Stephen Sepp, public hearing, March 19th. So moved. Here a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Elizabeth and Mike. Uh, Palatello, 324 Tarner, Tarner, Tanner Marsh Road, special permit for a home handicraft industry, receive a set of public hearing of March 5th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Maria and Germa, Ale, I guess, special permit for the accessory apartment in a detached structure, receive and set of public hearing of March 19th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Maria Dushkin, 19 Fair Street, special permit for a meditation group in an existing mm. building. Receive and set a public hearing of March 19th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mm. Christine Offridi, 130 uh, Leeds Island Road, uh, CAM site plan revision to allow stairway access to the deck in the house. Receive and set a public hearing for March 5th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Chris McManus, 78 Seaside Avenue, uh, CAM site plan to demolish an existing home and replace with a slightly smaller home and a new septic system. Receive and set a public hearing for April 16th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is this that little red uh, shack? Mm -hmm. Yep, it is. They're actually going right to build? build? Well, we'll, we'll find, find out. out. We'll, we'll see. We'll find out, yeah. <laughs> As we say, it's they, they need to make the showing and convince us of that, I guess. Yeah. Site plans, uh, Towering Oaks, 800 Boston Post Road. This is a site plan approval to demolish uh, an existing building and construct two medical office retail buildings. Receive and set a uh, meeting date of public, I'm sorry, just receive and set a meeting date of March 5th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. What's 800 Boston Post Road? What is that? That's the former Ponticellus. Ponticellus. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. Walter, why don't you take the next one? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, right, yeah. Um, site plan number two, Guilford Gatehouse West, 2614 Boston Post Road, map 83, lot 20, zone CD. Site plan revision, location of housing units, receive and set meeting date of March 5, 2014. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, the next one, uh, we had a recent meeting of the zoning subcommittee and there were a number of miscellaneous amendments uh, that we'd like to receive and set a public hearing for that on March 19th. George, do you think you could just briefly review those with the full commission so that we can? Sure. There's copies of the You have a copy of the text? Right, right. The first, uh, the, the first two uh, deal with the issue of additions to, to buildings and 
what constitutes an addition in the context of the special permit process for accessory apartments. Remember we had that debate with regard to one of the applications. Yeah. This, these, this series of amendments attempts to um, clarify our intention there. Um, these are all these are all been drafted by and recommended by the zoning committee. So the first two deal with that, and then the third one is uh, an attempt to respond to some of the concern about um, zoning map and text amendments that the process might be too expeditious. Um, and what this would require is that where there is a petition regarding a zoning map or text amendment, the commission has to have at least two public hearings. Or one public, I guess it's really one public hearing, but it's have, have it occur on these two days. Right, two continue days. just to try yeah. a compromise or at least to try right. to address the issue where text changes to the zoning code at times don't need to be have written notice, but a zoning map change does, where you have to notice the neighbors by certified mail. And we debated this, but well, we'll get into it when we when we send it out for public hearing. But the problem was, if it's just one piece of property, it's relatively easy to identify who are affected. But if we were to change the zoning code to say something like any property that is smaller than so many square feet and has this type of a condition, and it's a large area that we're looking at, it may be almost impossible to accurately identify all the people who should receive written notice. So what we did say, though, is that the best way to handle this is to have one public hearing. There would be publicity about that, and then we could not vote on it until at least the next public hearing in case people wanted to come in and comment on it. All right, so uh, if I can get a motion to receive and send a public hearing for these on March 19th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, a quick question. Um, is it possible to add another? Uh, I just, when I was looking at 273.36a, which is talking about accessory structures, um, there's almost a practically a parenthetical comment that says the creation of an accessory apartment in a detached accessory structure must be authorized pursuant to 273.19, which is the section. The question is whether we want to also add in the phrase detached or partially detached into 273.36. I think that's prudent. And if, can we go ahead and do that? Yeah. So can those, we just yeah. amend yes. that? Yes, amend the motion to include that. 273.36a. Because it hasn't gone out for notice yet, so we can still do that. Yeah. Good, Good. Good catch, yeah. David. Um, so amended. Okay. Um, who seconded that? Uh, I will re second. Re and all in favor of sending that out with the amendment? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, we received a number of letters uh, related to the issue of the J.J. Sullivan propane. I did discuss this with Chuck to try to determine the appropriate action, and the con consensus is that these should be placed in a file and if and when an application is filed uh, by J.J. Sullivan, these would go into the record for that application. But we don't have an application before us now, so there's not much we can do with these letters. We would also want to, want to include um, the letter that we received immediately after the zone change from Mr. Um, Dins. Dins. Yeah. Um, because we received that off um, to give the applicant the opportunity to respond to those, presumably. Yeah, those, absolutely. His those. concerns would be the same, but that, that letter might be Should lost be. in the shuffle and because it was not to an application. One, uh, apparently, Mr. Dins did, same did send another <laughs> one on February 3rd, but all those should be held aside. And like I said, if and when there's an application before us, those should all go into the public record there. All right, Reg, I guess we have a municipal uh, citation violation and a site plan approval for storage facility 278 Goose mm -hmm. Lane. Yeah, this is the uh, Goose Lane storage uh, facility. It's across the street from Village Victoria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was first, it, this was first brought to my attention by attorney Lee Titus, who is representing the Village Victoria residents. Uh, they objected to the fact that there was, there were boats and uh, trucks and box trucks and 
derelict looking trucks uh, parked outside uh, for outside storage. And when I looked at the site plan for the property, no outside storage was approved. So um, on February 13th of last year, um, I sent Daniel Carter, who uh, is in charge of the property and who's the uh, owner, one of the owners, um, a violation letter and a cease and desist order to take these things out, to get rid of them. Uh, he got rid of some of the things, but here we are a year later and there are still uh, vehicles that he moved from the front of the property to the back. They're now hidden by the storage units, but they're still there. And the point is, no outside storage is approved for the property. He has not come to the commission to ask to have outside storage. So the property clearly is in violation, and uh, it's in violation of the approval that we gave to them. I am here to ask you if you think it's appropriate for me to uh, commence uh, sending municipal fine citations to Mr. Carter to see if we can uh, get him to move on this a little quickly. Uh, the fact that it's winter time and there's a lot of snow uh, does not make me feel sorry for him because he's had so much time. Okay. And I, I have a letter that I wrote to him uh, and in the letter, I detail uh, things like on February 13th, he got a second notice of cease and desist order. On April 9th, I spoke to him and he told me some things were going to go and he was going to give me paperwork for a truck and this and that. Didn't happen. Um, on April 30th, I talked to him again. Some progress had been made, but most of the things had been moved to the back of the property. On May 6th, um, I observed all these things in the back of the property. And uh, on June 1st, uh, these things were still in the back of the property. Uh, on June 7th, I wrote him a third notice of cease and desist. Again, some of the things are still there. On July, I spoke to him, and, and he was going to bring uh, registrations into the office for cars on his property. Uh, there was a Grumman truck that's been there for a long, long time. It, it hadn't been removed. There was an old Thompson and Burns uh, truck that was still there. He told me he was going to move it. It didn't happen. There was The box truck was there. He was going to move that. It didn't happen. On October 31st, uh, Attorney Titus called me and, you know, said they're, they're not happy because progress isn't happening. Uh, on November 7th, uh, I called and, and left him a message about the sailboat and the powerboats that hadn't been removed. And he never called me back about it. Um, and so I wrote him this letter um, on February 7th, and, and what I said, and I have to tell you, this is true. I've been patiently waiting for compliance since February 3rd, 2013. Mm -hmm. The time for conformity with the approval granted by the Planning and Zoning Commission on October 8th, 1986 has come and gone. <laughs> it's now time for me to go to the next enforcement step, and I'm here. Okay. Um, before we get a motion on this, is there any discussion or any questions that anyone has for Reg? How much are you looking at? Per day, 150. 150. The maximum fine that the commission can authorize me to uh, issue is $150 per day per violation. How many violations are there? Well, it's one violation. Just one violation, even outdoor storage. outdoor storage. So 150 bucks a day. Right. So each boat, for instance, is not a separate no. violation. No. It isn't. Okay. We, have, we have complaints from the neighbors. It sounds like you have brought this to his attention. He has not articulated any extenuating circumstances to justify his inability to bring the property into conformance. There are some things and that were removed, but there are others that have just been lingering there for a year now. Seems pretty straightforward. And I've gotten a lot of, you know, promises from him. Yes, I'm going to take this out as soon as I fix this truck. I can move that, but 
some maybe They're some there. additional motivation might help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right then. Why don't we get a motion uh, to uh, recommend the institution of the 150-day move, move to authorize um, a fine of up to $150 per day. Uh, well, well, up to right. So she can. I mean, because you well, can, you could fine him a hundred dollars a day if you saw fit for some reason, right? Well, I'm here to ask the commission for permission to fine, and also for the amount that you mm -hmm. want me to fine. You want me to find the uh, <laughs> maximum? I would. I would say. We're in a public why don't we give you the authority to fine at the rate of one hundred and fifty dollars a day, using your discretion? Right. You're authorized starting tomorrow. Okay. To starting tomorrow. Based upon your discretion, or whenever you give them notice, based upon your discretion to start the fining of $150 per day. Do you, do you want to first send them a certified letter saying starting on Monday I am? So no, but she, she's That's told done. them that I'm going to do she's this fine. I've told I'm, them I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that she has so you, how, what, how high a hurdle do you want to set? She's waited a year. That's not what I'm just saying. That she's waited 381 days. I, I just told them I in think. the letter that if I just want to make sure those knows. items weren't gone by February 19th, I shall have no choice but to request permission from the Planning and Zoning Commission to fine you up to $150 per day for each day the violations exist. That's okay. fine. That's fine. So at your discretion. No, I just want to just want yeah. to make sure use, that he knows that he's going to Use, fine. You, use yeah. your judgment, but you're authorized starting tomorrow, $150 per day, your discretion. Uh, so Second. if I can just get, okay, uh, any discussion on that motion? All in favor? Aye. Okay, then Aye. you're all set. Thank you. Um, okay, zoning committee did meet and we already talked about the results of that meeting. We have two bills to pay, one for short publishing, $134.62, and then another one for... Wait, wait, oh. back up. Zoning committee. Oh, I did. I talked about... Uh, no, there's no. two things. Oh, what's the other one? The, uh, the um, um, moratorium discussion with council yes. on the uh, First we, Amendment issues. And Mr. Then. Smith is here, too, by the way. Okay. We did get um, a letter from Chuck... In town council, I asked that everybody receive a copy of yeah. that. Everybody receive that yep. email, and we the did. recommendation mm -hmm. was not to to implement uh, a moratorium at this time. Oh. It, yeah, I thought we forwarded that to all the people. Yeah, that's right. I had asked that it be but, forwarded um, to everybody. Okay. So uh, both Walter town didn't get it, or he didn't. He hasn't checked his email in a couple of weeks or something like that. But <laughs> I th guess every, everybody else presumably you, did get it. I have Just, spam folders. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, Chuck. Both Chuck. And uh, town council felt we were on shaky ground trying to pursue that. And town council asked that we not do that. Um, so we can take the opinion up uh, at the next zoning committee meeting to study it further and then finalize what we want to do on that. Um, but the recommendation uh, from both, as I recall, was not, not to try to move forward with that. It's, you get into the First Amendment issue. And I think that was it. So uh, we'll put that on the further discussions. or something else that we needed to? Yes, David needs to talk. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go get him. Mm, I have a <laughs> surprised and startled look on my face for a reason. This is a matter concerning Craig Smith. Yeah, I remember all. I remember that we aspect. Had, we had, I think we had a resolution of the issue today, which you probably didn't hear about, David. Mm, I don't know. Which is that the zoning code was. Re was readopted in its entirety in 2000, in between the time when he built the house mm -hmm. and the time when he made application to build the pool. And therefore, the building of the pool, if I understand this correctly, is subject to the current zoning. And therefore, he'll have to get a variance if he wants to build the pool. Those, the, the facts. It, w it would seem that in March of 2012, we readopted the entire Correct. code. And therefore, it and was an improved lot the C as of the C of O being issued. Right. And there is now subject to any changes to the zoning code the adopted after it becoming an approved lot. And because the entire zoning regulations were readopted, 
therefore the, right. the current as of you know anything that happened after the issuance of the certificate of occupancy on the building or not a, not a certificate of occupancy but the, the building permit I think is when it gets triggered as to become a I can't remember but yeah so yeah. now the whatever the current zoning there is C uh, um, R8 R8 which is, is the zoning we have to comply with. That, but I think the consensus the of the review that was made today. The, the fact, there, there are certainly two facts that are, that are pretty clear, which is that the improvement happened in 2011. The building happened in 2011. The C of O was issued in 2011. And in March of 2012, the entire code the, the entire zoning code for the town of Guilford was readopted. Sure. The application in of a brand new zoning code. In effect, a brand new zoning code. The application of the statute to those two, um, to those two events, um, I wouldn't commit to, and it's not clear to me. And I and I think David may but, be right. But for the fact that the zoning code was wholesale readopted, I did. I personally agreed with your interpretation of the statute and the question yeah. was what happened because I, it wasn't just that we did some piecemeal revisions to the zoning I thought in 2012 we wholesale redid it and that's the answer apparently is that we did please yes please yeah please I, I would appreciate the listening to me um, that's position to now loop as a matter of fact that uh, possibly it would be sort of the the entire code, which it was, would be readopted. <clears throat> For whatever it's worth, and when I look at the statute, it says changes. It doesn't say readoption, reaffirmation of zoning laws already in place. It says when ch adopted changes to the zoning code. And, and in, in my opinion, the readoption of laws already in effect is not a change. And therefore, I still think my position is correct in that <clears throat> we're subject only as it relates to improvements to the property only to zoning regulations or boundary changes that changes that are adopted subsequent to the time that our lot's considered improved. Under the regulation, it was improved probably in December of 2010 uh, because by definition, when the permit is issued and when the foundation is completed, which was about 2010, we closed in 2011, that's when our property is considered approved, improved. <clears throat> Therefore, my position is there was never a change uh, in, in, in the zoning after that approval. You may have readopted the regulations, but clearly that's not a change. That's just a readoption, a reaffirmation and therefore, under those circumstances, I still think my position is valid. Mm -hmm. And the practical, the practical difference here is whether or not a variance is required, and therefore, the expense of an A2 survey is incurred. Well, that's one of the problems, and you may not get the variance. Is the other Correct. because you need a legal hardship for that. So then, where you come out that you don't need a variance? <coughs> that's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. But I come out. The, with the subdivision we live in was approved back in 1977. Uh, at that time, our property was zoned R6. Subsequent to the approval of that particular subdivision, um, our property was rezoned, the subdivision was rezoned R8. To me, the law is pretty clear that we're not, as a lot owner, obligated to conform uh, to any, any, any zoning changes adopted subsequent to the approval of that subdivision. So the issue is just what we discussed. Well, what about Smith? The fact that the property is approved. <clears throat> what what zoning regulations are you required to comply with? Are you required to comply with ch changes in zoning regulations that are adopted subsequent to subsequent to the time that our lots deemed approved, which was in December of 2010. After December of 2010, there weren't any changes adopted. Maybe mm -hmm. reaffirmed. Mm -hmm. Readopted regulations already in effect. There were no changes adopted. In other words, we were zoned R8 before then, and with the reaffirmation, we were still zoned R8. Our position is because R8, the zoning for R8 
was prior to the time our property was approved and subsequent to the time that the subdivision was approved that were governed by the R6 regulations, and therefore we don't need the variance. Okay. Any discussion? I was, other. I was anticipating that we would have that, that all that, that documentation would be in front of the commission so that the commission could read it also and weigh in on, you know, what we would. There's the minutes. We have the minutes. Do we have the minutes? The minutes are in there. The minutes are in there. And uh, his wait. letters to you. Wait, the minutes are. And his CFO. So these minutes are from March of 2010. That's the from the zoning code. March 7, 2012. Oh, these are the minutes. Okay. And we the readoption. All right. So where's what do we got? Do we have the statute also? And what do we have? Is there a motion for us? Uh, it's just essentially it's an interpretation. What do we think is required? Is what there a guidance yes. to? Rich is asking you for interpretation of the rules uh, and whether or not to require variance or deny a building permit application for this school. From time, uh, time to time when staff gets a question and it requires an interpretation of the zoning code, if it's not clear, exactly what is meant by it. We have that authority. To we have it. the, yes, since we were the ones who drafted it, we are the ones who staff will go to to ask for an interpretation to guide them. So it's up to us to. Sort of administration. And the particulars, opinion. the particulars are if you bought this lot, it was R6, Fortis Foundation, and then it changed to R8? Um, <laughs> no. No. When the subdivision was approved, yeah. the zone that the subdivision land is in is zone R6. The subdivision was approved as a cluster subdivision, which we do not have in our regulations anymore. Mm -hmm. That was replaced, correct me if I'm wrong, George, with the open space subdivision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what you're kind of talking about interpretation of a statute. A state statute. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which statute? Which should have been interpreted interpreted by some municipality at some point since it was enacted because yeah. it's been in effect for all of Connecticut for yeah. what statute is it? Yeah. It's uh, it's uh, section eight dash twenty six A B two A of the statutes. And we didn't bring that along. You, you have it? Yeah. Can you can we see it? Has this been interpreted by any Does it have the uh, notes by any chance or case notes underneath it? Uh, I, 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 I didn't come across any. <coughs> I pulled this today off the web during assembly. We have no case law with this? There's got to be case law. Um, there's case law. Um, the question, but what we're interpreting is, uh, or the, the, the issue is that shall be required to conform to a zoning change adopted subsequent to said lot becoming an improved lot. And so what we're dancing on the head of is the issue of if we amended and restated entirely the entire zoning code in 2012, is that a zoning change adopted subsequent to the lot becoming an improved lot? Because it became an improved lot in 2011. Improved, not approved. Improved. Improved. Became an improved. I am approved. Um, and then we wholesale 
we revised and amended and readopted our zoning regulations. Is, does that constitute a zoning change for purposes of 8-26A um, to B2A? Mm -hmm. It says that an approved lot is subject to zoning changes adopted subsequent to the lot becoming an approved lot. Right. Uh, for the rest. For the record and for the commissioners, I'd just like to read our motion from March of 2012. Um, it was a motion by Mr. Sassine and second by, seconded by Commissioner Grigsby. Voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve minor amendments to the zoning code dated February 1, 2012 in preparation for making the regulations available online in digital format and approve said digital format of the zoning code section 273-23.1 to remain in the regulations and the bulk of 273-93 is removed from the regulations as a standalone document. These amendments and the new code are approved based upon a finding that new format of the code will make the code more accessible to the public. These amendments and the digitized code are effective on March 16, 2012. So I guess it comes down to does that constitute a change? That is very... And I think you got to, well, I, when we say change, to me that's a substantive change. I think the change that we put in place there was to get that into an electronic format. I think there was some cleaning up of uh, maybe wording and formatting, things of that nature, so that it could be put out there in an electronic format. But in terms of making a substantive change to it, I don't think that was the intent of it. And I think... The substantive change was made prior to the... 2000 right. 10 day or whatever. That's right. Bill so if, if we're relying upon that as a change, I'm not sure. I, I think <coughs> I agree with Mr. Uh, Smith that that is not a change for the purposes of the way it's used in the statute. I think that's a substantive change. So when was the substantive change? Or when was the most recent substantive change? We don't know. When was the R8 zoning created? Yeah, 1969. No, it was no. after the subdivision. <laughs> It was shortly thereafter, it was sometime I think in like 1978 or something like that. It was approved September 30th, 1978. I'll show you the map. Okay. So everybody who okay. has... But he didn't improve <coughs> his lot until well after. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the equity argument of this is if mm -hmm. you get your lot approved, okay, you have your lot, but you haven't gotten around the building on it. Mm. Yeah, that, yeah. You, you can you can yeah. rely on the, the code. Yeah, the equity argument is I bought this lot, exactly. I haven't gotten around to building on it yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I should essentially have the right to build on it the way that I could have built on it the, the day it was approved under the zoning regulations that were in force at the time I right. approved right. Or they, I bought the lot. So what I, I have no issue at all with if the gentleman had said, I'm gonna build my house now and I'm gonna build my pool now, and I'm gonna build it under the auspices of the R6 zoning, which was in force right. when this lot was created. The issue is, he's doing it in two steps. He built the house under the R6, and now he's coming back after the fact, saying, now I wanna build my pool, and I still wanna be under R6, even though Maybe I'm an improved lot, maybe I'm not an improved lot. I, I think there are, it's a legitimate argument on both sides of it. Yeah. You know, I myself said we, I, I asked the question of did we wholesale amend our zoning regulations and readopt them, and the answer was we did. Therefore, I think that's, that's, uh, that's where I thought that it's a change, but I, I'm not willing to fall on a sword over it. Let me understand what you're saying. Mm. And I'm gonna, it's a little deep. It's, it's, oh, yeah, I hurt my head, too. So if you buy a lot and it's approved for something, it's approved forever and we can never change that approval, ever? The, the opposite is true. Well, no. if he, he could buy the lot, if he bought, if he bought the lot, if that lot had never been developed since 1977, he bought it today, and 
no one had ever built on it, he would be able to build on it in accordance with the R6 rules. Oh, okay, so he built the house. It's the fact goal. that he built the house according to the R6 rules. Uh, and got in doing seat. that, you give up the right to be exempt from any changes that might have occurred. Uh, Is that obvious to people? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, who would know? But that's critically important. Mm -hmm. And who are we to say, all right, well, you didn't know it, and it's kind of obscure, but too bad. Who are we to say either way, though? Well, somebody, we are the ones yeah, we, to unfortunately, I think. Somebody, on the other hand, somebody with a lot next door who bought, the, bought a house that was all built and everything would be led to believe, well, the zoning is R8, and therefore mm -hmm. my neighbor has to conform to the R8 requirements. But in fact, the other argument is he doesn't have to conform to the RA, even though there's a house on it there. Mm -hmm. He has to conform to the RA requirements, but in fact, no, he doesn't have to conform to RA. He can still conform to R6. If there's no house, he could. If there's no house, if he there's could. there's no house, he definitely could. But if Correct. there's a house, then we're going to decide. Then the question right. is... Yeah, here, here we have the issue of, I've got, I live at 123 Main Street. My neighbor lives at 125 Main Street. I built my house 20 years ago. I want to put in a pool. I have to go for a variance. My neighbor built his house two years ago. Even though we're all in the same subdivision, he built it two years ago. He's got his argument. He gets to put in the pool because he gets to pretend that he's still back in 1978 or whatever. Is, is, so she, is there an answer to this that we should have the attorney look into, our con attorney? He looked at it already. What did he look at and what did Rose I can't parts? remember if we talked to him. I don't think we asked Chuck. I don't think we've asked Chuck. I don't think we've asked Chuck. Do you think it's not worth it? Um, it worth it? Well, I mean, I think it's... it's actually, it's a great yeah, idea. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we could ask him. I think it's going to it may come back to the... It's up to you guys. Yeah, I'm sure. I just want to make sure what you're saying was when it says changes subsequent, what kind of... Changes, changes do we really I can't do. imagine though that this so. is a novel no, a it's concept. Not. So, I don't Sir, want to, um, what are the limits? Yeah, would you like exactly. to weigh in and also just mention to us whether or not you think the time of purchase should apply to our decision here, um, and how how it might apply? Time of purchase. Yeah, the time that you purchased the land. What I think should apply is the, the time of foundation is complete. Just statute mm -hmm. that once the permit was issued foundation complete by definition under this statute I think it's under subsection B under those particular circumstances our our, our lot is considered improved mm -hmm. so from that point going forward which is not December just 2010 from that point going forward we would be subject there's no question in my mind we're subject to to, to zoning changes May subsequent to the date that our lot was deemed approved. So subsequent to December 10th, there's no argument there, 2000, December of 2010, we're going to be subject to any, any zoning changes made. But, but before that, no. If, they, if, that, if that answers your question, in other words, in other words, then what are we, if, if we look at the statute, then, then what regulations are we subject to? Well, we're subject to those. And I'm not trying to split hairs, it's just the way I interpret the statute. We're subject to the zoning regulations that were in effect at the time the subdivision was approved. And we're exempt from any subsequent zoning regulations enacted by the town. Um, until such time as our lot has, has become approved, which is in December 2010, and then we're subject after that date to any subsequent uh, uh, zoning changes. So you're saying you're not subject to anything that was from the time the subdivision was approved up through the date that you approved it. Those don't come into effect after you've approved it, ever. In other words. Yes, that's correct. Right. Okay. So, and that's where I seem to have a problem. That yeah. because. I think I see, I mean, David's point, I believe, and correct me, David, if you're wrong, so I don't want to state something incorrectly, correct but, if but if you were, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, if you, if he asked for the pool at the same time he poured the foundation, the whole thing would be exempt. But what's happened is you built the house, now you want to get the pool. If we follow that logic, then anybody in that air subdivision for the next hundred years 
is just, not subject is to not our subject to our new our own. Um, well, right? It depends on when they built their when their house got built. That's well, how right. Many, when it's approved. How many smoking guns are out there of these properties that are in this precarious position? How many unimproved lots are running around? Not, not too many, every, I'm sure. But every R8 zone on your zoning map was changed from R6 to R8. When? 78. 1978. And so he originally bought the property in 1970. I bought the property in 2010. Just it was an unimproved, but it was mm -hmm. not built. And, and I and I understand that where you bought the lot and you just decided not to build for a while, we shouldn't change the rules on you because you bought intended to build. And they so, may not have bought the lot otherwise. Right. The, pro the question though is is okay after you've approved it. I think what this gentleman is saying is only zoning amendments that we make from that date forward apply to him. Nothing that occurred right. Right. between the time. That subdivision came into being and allowed that lot up to that date. He, you don't have to ever follow those. I mean, that's sort of the reading I'm getting of it, which doesn't sound right to me. Right. No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, it, Either it, way, it, it doesn't. doesn't but it's, it's exactly what the statute is saying. And even there's some commentary that I've read that states that, that does, in some respects, pose a problem for towns. Okay. No question about it. But what? It's, but it's what the statute say. I mean, well, then the so other issue is what's the that problem for the town and that they're different. Yeah. Right. I mean, we we got to take the statute the way it's written. Was the readoption of the code in 2011 or whatever it was, 2012, was where we reconfirmed the R8 zone? Was that a change with respect to this particular situation? Uh, that's that's yeah. why. Was the format question. change enough to be a change? Well, even the I mean, in effect, the zoning was operable on this lot was R6, and we. Right. We created, we reconfirmed the change that was made prior to 2010, R6 to RA. We reconfirmed that. So this is was that a change so. or not? Or not? <clears throat> Mr. Smith is saying, no, it was not a change. No, it wasn't a substantive change. Yeah. Right. I, don't, I don't think it was a substantive change. I mean, I think we did it for formatting and to get it into an electronic format. I recall the discussions it, that we, we purposely didn't want to make. Right. But if it turns out it was R6 at the time, then it actually was a substantive change because we made it R8. Well, it wasn't well, really no, R6. It was, it was changed to R8. It was R8. Right. We, it was no, a, I mean, if it was effectively R6 because of the statute. Right. What does that yeah. mean? Uh, I don't think that was the intent of it. Oh, well, no. Okay. This was never and, I don't, and if the statute says change, I don't think it means the format or just changing it from paper to electronic. I mean, to me, it means you made changes to the wording and the meaning, they were substantive changes. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. Uh, we, I just have one more comment. Yes. What authority do we have? This, what he's proposing conflicts with the zoning regulation as it stands today. As right? it's written. As well, it's written. here's the problem. But not necessarily. Where, where the town staff is saying that he needs to get a variance to construct the pool, yeah. because, because in an R8 zone, no, I, he yeah, does, I understand that. he needs it, R6, he doesn't. Yeah. And Reggie, and he's saying, well, it's not totally clear. So it's because currently in an R six eight zone. Yes. Okay. Yes. Correct. And the R eight zone would require him to get a pool, uh, get a variance. variance. Correct. Correct. Yes. So what yes, authority do we have? Coverage. What authority do we have then to go against our our, um, our regulations? Because well, what's this, happened is that if he's, he's seeking guidance him. from the I, commission okay. saying. Then that's fine. I talked to Reggie, and Reggie thinks that I need a variance. I don't think I need a variance. I, I just want to submit a okay. you know building permit or you know whatever. Right. So then, so I, just, I don't think that we have, then I just don't think that we have authority to. Well, to who? Sit. The question is, somebody has to interpret somebody, our zoning yeah. regulations, and it's us. I mean, it's us. Interpret our zoning Well, here's the if if it isn't R six. Yeah. If he's under R six rules, he doesn't need a variance. Yeah, if he's no, under R eight, he needs a variance. Okay, so. A variance poses <laughs> two problems for him. First, he might not get it, and second, it requires the expense of an A2 survey. Right, at least. And he oh. needs to demonstrate legal hardship. And he, yes. So, so is this something we're voting on? Well, here's what I would like to suggest, is not to pump this any further, but I want to get this resolved by the next meeting. Can yeah. we get Chuck to take a look at all yeah. of the information we have here and to study, mm -hmm. so we're not guessing it, was there any interpretation of the statute? Uh, what what's Chuck's opinion 
There's still a case of like water, water or something like that. Yeah, it, it, Poirier. 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 Exactly. So yeah. let's let's right. Poirier versus Zoning Board of Appeals of the Town of Wilton. So let's see if Chuck can do some legal research on this and get back to us so that we don't hold these people up any longer one way or the other when we try to come to a resolution at the next meeting. You don't really want to have a pool anyway, right? It's right. just theoretical. <laughs> well, right. well, there's a lot of snow right now, so, so two more weeks won't make too much difference. No, we owe, but we owe you. <laughs> we owe you a resolution of this to the extent that you Please. Yes, please. I don't know if it's appropriate or not. But there is there is an easier resolution, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh no, no. I, there, that, I didn't like your sliding scale <laughs> of changing percentages. Okay. So I mean, whatever. Okay. Okay. So we will we will ask council to review it to report back to us at the next meeting, and then we'll have to, uh, as a team here, take that up and come with a decision one way or the other. That's deep. But at least people now are aware of what the problem the issue is. All right, so uh, I think we're now done with zoning committee, and we can move on to the approval of the bills. Pay the bills. Uh, Shore Publishing 134.62 and KMG $40. Can I get a motion? Move to pay the bills. Okay, I heard a motion. Do I hear a second? All in favor? Aye. Okay, pay the bills. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, last item, approval of the minutes. The minutes of 12, 18, 13. Mm -hmm. Move to approve uh, the December 18th minutes. Second. Okay. Any updates, changes, modifications? People had a chance to review it. I have none. That should have gone out. Uh, I did see them. They were in the email. I they were sent out like three times. Yeah. We had a punt on the last time. Okay, uh, any changes, discussion, Ron? Hearing none, I'll call for vote. All in favor, accepting minutes? Aye. Aye. I abstain those. Here. Okay. Uh, approval of the 115, I'm, I'm assuming that's 2014 uh, regular meeting minutes. Yes. I can get a motion. So moved. Okay, do I get a second? Second. Okay, any discussion, updates, changes? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Okay, those are approved. Good. <laughs> uh, like having no more business, I'll call for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All favor? Okay, we're adjourned.